go out to the world. Very cool. All right, guys, welcome to the League of Extraordinary and Scientists and Engineers, Sciencing Chats 2021 as part of the San Diego Festival of Science and Engineering. Uh, 2021, you guys can go there live at steamfestival2021.org. Uh, we want to uh, thank uh, Love STEM SD for putting together this festival during this little bit of a crazy time. We really appreciate you doing that. All of our great scientists and engineers uh, made videos for you guys to see prior to their chat. Um, and then they just came in here to answer a few questions for you. So the first person is going to be up in about 15 minutes. Uh, first, I would like to tell you guys a little bit about us and how we came together. So the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers came together as a group of parents of scientists and engineers and educators um, that wanted to bring free and accessible science to kids in their schools, in their classrooms, and wherever they are um, for equity and access. And basically, I uh, knew a lot of these people, and so they came into our living room, and we invited them to come and all talk to us. We had uh, the person that was working on saving the damage on bank. We had, uh, you know, engineers from all over the place, nano uh, engineers, all kinds of crazy, beautiful minds. And we wanted to invite them to talk to the kids. And so that's what we did. And that's how the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers began to going to schools. Um, we started going to elementary schools, mainly K-8. And uh, now we've moved all the way through high schools. Uh, we have a lot of our scientists and engineers that speak in colleges and uh, we move with them to do that. Uh, we try to make it fun. We try to make it engaging. Um, and we really try to keep all of you guys. The main thing is to have you be curious to have you be curious about the world around you, anything that blows your mind. So today, while we're having this chat, what I'd like you to do, because a lot of you are not going to have your microphones on, is that if you hear something that you never knew before this chat, and you just learned today, or you just learned in the video chat of the scientist that's speaking, can you all just do this? that your mind was blown by what you just heard. And for your questions, you can either raise your hand and I'll unmute you, or you could put them in the chat. Uh, we have a list of questions that uh, were sent to the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers from classrooms and teachers for some of the scientists that we'll definitely uh, try to get to. Uh, first and foremost, we're gonna answer the questions of the people that are here on the live feed today. So if you are here, make sure that uh, we see you, make sure that your hands are up, 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 um, and also post in the chat. And anyone here, please help me also uh, see all of the chat. Does that sound good? Yes, we're in for a very fun time. So you guys can go to our YouTube channel, the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers, and we have all of the YouTubes that are gonna be there all year long from all of these scientists, you can use them anywhere you want. They are open access. Uh, you can use them in your schools. You can use them wherever the kids, however they make you curious. Um, a huge, huge shout out uh, to STEAM Festival. That's S-T-E-A-M festival.org for putting this together. You guys can go there. They're going to have all the YouTubes of all of these ridiculous, amazing minds on their website all year long as well. So we're really excited uh, to be partnered with them and thank um, all the staff at the lovestem.org community for helping us put this together. So today, just to give you a highlight of what of who we're gonna be hearing from is from uh, 1015 to 1030, we're gonna talk to Dr. Lisa Ziegler Allen uh, she's from the Craig Venter Institute and Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and she's going to talk to you about good viruses. So we've all heard a lot about bad viruses, right? 
but she's going to come and talk to us about the good viruses. She does ocean ecology. I'm really excited for that. At 10.30 to 10.45, we're going to talk to my very good friend, Ben Frabel. He is the collection manager of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, Fishes, uh, and he collects millions and millions of fishes. If you want to know anything about fishes, Ben is the guy. Like, he's the guy. He has, and I, I heard he's going to bring something really exciting. If you guys have friends, text them now, tell them to join our live Zoom and come in here at 1045 to 11. Uh, we are going to uh, be speaking to Dr. Sonny Fugate. He's the senior research scientist at the Naval Information Warfare Center. Um, he's going to be talking to us about cyber defense and how we use gaming. What? Yes, you know, I was like, I just want to, I just want to be a gamer as my job. Yeah, I kind of think that's kind of what Sonny does a little bit, a little bit, right? Um, and then at 11 to 11 15, we're going to be talking to Jasmine Sadler. Jasmine Sadler is amazing. She is an engineer who has helped develop engines uh, for uh, airplanes, and she's also a ballet dancer like all the way around, full on STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, right? Um, hold on real quick, I'm gonna go to this. This is what I'm gonna do a lot today, is I'm gonna be like, oh, hold on, I need to check this out because I wanna make sure I'm tuned in to everybody. That's what is up. Nice. Um, so she's gonna talk to us about how she helped develop engines, but also how her love of STEAM, and she's also a math tutor. Any kids out there, you looking for a math tutor? Uh, let us know. Oh, yes, man, you know it. Megalodon tooth, I knew it. See, when Ben comes in, I told him, I was like, you better have a Megalodon tooth, my man. <laughs> um, and then 11.15 to 11.30, we're gonna have Angela Zomplish. She's an extremophile explorer. Does anybody here know what an extremophile explorer is? Anybody? So she goes to like Antarctica, the most Martian-like place on our planet. And she looks for extreme animals that can live in like really remote areas. Like, have you ever heard of water bears, tardigrades, nematodes? She looks at those things because if they can survive in the really harsh conditions of Antarctica where they thought nothing would live before, maybe, just maybe, there's actual life on Mars. Let's ask her about it when she comes. I'm super excited to ask her about that. And we already have a list of questions for her uh, that were sent in too. After that, 11.30, 11.45, we're gonna have Dr. Molly Maddie. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Salk Institute. She is, I call her Dr. DNA because she teaches DNA all the time and she's so good at it. She knows so much about DNA, but she also knows a lot about genetics. And right now she's studying the brains of worms to understand us better, to understand how brain waves work. So right now I've been calling, I was calling her Dr. DNA. Now I've been calling her the worm whisperer, hashtag worm whisperer. Then at 11.45 to noon, we're gonna have Dr. Alyssa Griffin. She talks about climate change. Uh, she actually scuba dives uh, around the coral reefs and she has all kinds of scientific experiments that are happening there. It's pretty amazing. If you haven't seen our YouTube video, we're going to be putting it in the chat when she comes to talk. Please go check it out because she also has a really, really easy science experiment for you guys to do and you can do it with your friends and I promise poof, your minds will be blown if you do this experiment that she shows you to teach you about ocean acidification and climate change and what uh, we could do to make it a little bit better. At noon to 12.15, you guys, Dr. Nicholas Galitsky is going to be here. So inside information, when I was making his YouTube video that you guys can go see, I got to go see the telescope that he's making. It's, it's as big as a helicopter. Way bigger than, it's like bigger than my, way bigger than my office, actually. My office is pretty small, but it's huge. And I got to see the inner workings and I got to see all the, and it's cold. It's super cold. So he taught me about Kelvin uh, versus Celsius and like the coldest thing, uh, at least in San Diego, but it's really, it's like 
below 400 degrees Celsius. It's really, really cold. And he has to keep all of that equipment cold so because it's running so fast. He's building a telescope, you guys, that is gonna be able to see 14 billion light years away. What is what what happened 14 billion light years away? Do you know what happened 14 billion light years ago? The Big Bang. So he's looking literally through light waves through time to see the remnants from the Big Bang. Holy back to the future, back to the past. Ridiculousness. Like someone is really, really doing that. That's not like science fiction, like it's really happening. And I got to see it. It was absolutely amazing to see. It was incredible to see his lab and where he's building this. His office is a giant warehouse where he's building this thing. And it's here in San Diego at uh, uh, UC uh, San Diego at their science and engineering place. It is amazing. After Nicholas Galitsky, we're gonna see, uh, listen to Professor Dr. Andy Allen from the J. Craig Venter Institute and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And he's going to be talking to us about how you see the smallest thing in the ocean that is basically the base of our food web. How do you see that? And right now they're still using kind of like buckets to gather that water and see stuff, but they're moving forward into advancement. So again, each time we have a speaker, we'll put their YouTube in the chat. Uh, so you guys can go pre or post uh, to see their YouTube. Today, we're gonna ask them a whole bunch of questions about their talk, about their science, and you guys get to talk to them. And we have a few in there. Whew, that was a lot, right guys? Nice. Well, a lot of people came in while I was doing that introduction. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers uh, chat. Oh, oh yeah, you can unmute. Um, and today we are going to be asking a couple questions. Post the actual chats that are on our YouTube channel at the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers YouTube, LXS. You can find their YouTubes there or in this chat. Um, and we want to give a shout out again to our friends at Steam Festival. Dot, uh, steamfestival2021.com. So that's steam, S T E S T E A M, festival.2021.com. Uh, I don't know why I can't keep saying that all correct. I said it like a hundred times the other day. <laughs> now I'm like, that's what it is. Steamfestival2021.com. These YouTubes are going to be there all year long. So uh, we're going to see that right now. All right, without further ado, I think we're gonna introduce our first guest. Before we do that, just to everybody know, we are recording this. This will be a posted video that uh, will be an open source resource for people to see that are gonna coincide with the videos from the scientists that teachers can use, kids can use, anyone can use. If it makes you curious and it makes you wonder more and do more, we're all about it. All right. Hey, Lisa. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. I'm so excited uh, for today. I have like, you're like elitist, you guys. So I'm super old school. I just want to show you guys. So, so they sent me all these things, but to organize it, I just like, that's pen and paper. We got mm -hmm. a lot of questions, but we also wow. have some people in here um, that want to ask you questions. So first I want to post um, in the chat. Boom. Um, so that is Lisa Ziegler Allen. That's Dr. Lisa Ziegler Allen. Uh, she works with the Craig Venter Institute and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She is a viral ecologist and she's going to tell us what that is um, and what that's about. Uh, one of the coolest things that I think about her, she goes on these really big ships in the middle of the ocean and uh, she basically unravels um, food webs, the base of the food chain, and make sense of it all. Um, and so she's here to uh, let us know about some good viruses. We've all heard about some bad viruses, but uh, 
yeah, give us some good news there. So welcome, Dr. Lisa Ziegler Allen. Thank you for being here. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. Okay. So you want me to start by talking about what a viral ecologist yes, is? Because exactly. I know it's Can not. You tell us exactly what that is. What is a viral ecologist? Yes. Okay. So it is different than a virologist. Um, in a sense. So a lot of you guys know probably a lot about human viruses. We know about the coronavirus right now, the flu, cold even comes from viruses. Um, and so in my mind, that to me is more of the traditional kind of virology because it deals with viruses that infect humans. Not totally the case, it's not the definition, but in my mind that is who's someone who works on viruses. And so I like to be under the umbrella of viral ecology because it really does a better job of describing what questions I'm interested in answering. And that has to do with viruses and how they interact with the environment and their host. Um, and so that's where the ecology part comes in because that's really the definition of it. ecology is how an organism, or in this case, a virus interacts with itself uh, or others within its population, the community, as well as the environment. And so kind of building up on all of those different levels. And so that's what a viral ecologist is. And I get to also tag it with marine usually, or oceanic, I think is how I was introduced in the video, but marine viral ecologists, because by and large, the majority of viruses that I study come from the ocean or, um, yeah, pretty much all of them actually do these days right now in the lab. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I am a marine viral ecologist, I would say. Very nice. So you you look at viruses. So you guys, you guys can ask questions in the chat. Um, obviously, Lisa, you know, I, I've had a lot of questions for you um, during this time. Like we're all really curious about viruses. I know those aren't the viruses specifically that um, you study. Uh, but the microscopic, right? We, we, we all know, like, they're all a little bit related. So lately, have you learned anything about um, the viruses in the ocean related to viruses that we have? Are, uh, is, the co is there anything in the ocean that's related to COVID anyway? Um, well, there are coronaviruses, yes. So in that same... Um, group, I wouldn't say family, but group of viruses. And actually the viruses that I study are also in a similar group. So there's, we call it taxonomy, right? How we bin organisms into classifications. You and I are homo sapiens, right? That's our genus and species. And there's other levels that move up from that. So actually the viruses, many of the viruses that I do study are actually within a higher umbrella that would also include coronaviruses and many other viruses that infect us. Um, I just happen to study ones that don't. Um, but biologically, there are some similarities um, in terms of potentially how they might interact with their host or how uh, they might live. And I put that in quotes because they're technically not alive, although that is a heavily debated concept in viral ecology and virology, whether or not viruses are alive. Um, I'm gonna stick with the dogma of they are not. <laughs> and that is because they require a host, right? They're almost like, uh, you can think of them as a parasite, right? They get in, they interact with their host and they need something within that host in order to replicate themselves. So to create a copy, right, of themselves or progeny, often you'll hear. Um, so yes, yeah, so basically there are similarities, um, not the exact same virus though. So viruses, actually it might be a good point to, to make here is, the majority of viruses are not what we call broad host range, meaning they're just gonna infect everything all at once. The majority of viruses are actually very specific in who they infect. And I think often that gets missed um, in how we pass on this information to everyone because everyone's like, oh, there's a virus and they'll just use the term virus and then just assume it's gonna infect everything on the planet, the dogs, the cats, you, you know, anything, your bunny, all those kinds of things. But usually they're very, very specific um, in terms of the host that they interact with. Very cool. So we have several questions for you that are coming in. They're coming in hot right now. Uh, Tracy Howe would like to know, is it hard to observe in, into a microscope while on a ship in the ocean? Yeah, it, um, well, yes and no. So we've done it multiple times, actually. We've had different kinds of microscopes. So there's different um, uh, sort of levels of microscopy, right? So how deep we can go and how much we can see, right? So for viruses, in order to see what we say, the morphology, the shape, 
um, and sometimes size of viruses because they're so tiny. We have to use special uh, microscopes like electron microscopes. Um, and so at sea, we have used a certain type of electron microscope, but that was actually to look at their host diatoms, which was pretty amazing that it actually worked because when you get to those microscopes that you really need high resolution, right, to see those super tiny organisms, you don't want any movement. So they had this special table, but you're on a ship, it moves constantly. So it still moved quite a bit. It was very difficult to get images. But on the other side of that, we use um, light microscopes, um, uh, fluorescent microscopes we've taken out to look at how many viruses we have in there. And we do that by staining them so that we can make them a little bit larger. And then we use a microscope that can see them. Um, and that's much easier to do on a ship because you don't need it. Um, you don't have to be quite as steady as an electron microscope. All right, just a reminder, every time you guys hear something that you didn't know before this chat, so you'll see me doing this a lot. I just did that. I didn't, I didn't realize that you guys dyed them to, to be able to see it better. So another question, uh, we have several, so I'm gonna try to uh, rapid fire them a little bit. How many girls are on your science boat? It, yes. That comes from it, Addison Montoy. I wanna make sure that uh, Addison okay. Montoy, thank you for that question, yes. All right, well, thank you for that question. It's an important one. And you know, um, I've been going out to sea for a number of years. Uh, can, I can't do that math that quickly, apparently, but <laughs> for a long time, and I've been on many different ships, uh, I've been very fortunate and I love going. And there's been times where it's me and one other woman. I, that was the lowest number that I think I've been out to see. And, and generally most of the ships have been about for the science, there's the science crew and then there's the crew of the ship that actually you know makes the boat go where we want it to go. Cause let's face it, we actually don't know how to do that. Oftentimes <laughs> as scientists. And so, um, for the science crew, the lowest I've been is with two. And generally there's like 10 to 20, maybe 25 scientists on board. And then I wanted to just point out really recently, it was not one that I went on right off the coast of California. There's a program called Cal Coffee and there was an all women's crew, science crew, which I thought was pretty amazing. Yes. Cal Coffee. I don't know. So when, before you leave, don't, don't leave yet. We have a lot of questions, but okay. you, before you leave, can you copy that link into our chat? That would be yes. great. The Cal copy. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it's all Towner. Am I saying your name right? Nice. Uh, she wants to know, can any viruses you study infect humans? Um, so there's viruses. So one thing that um, that I get to do is to go out and also look at just the all the viruses that are present in what we call a community, we try to do that. So the whole swath that are out there. And so when we do those kinds of studies, there are viruses that infect humans, particularly along the coast. Um, sometimes we think that those get washed in, say if we have a rain event, right? All of that rainwater is coming in and you well find um, viruses that do infect humans. And there's also a few viruses that infect humans and also infect marine mammals. Um, so dolphins and other or, uh, organisms out there, so the bigger uh, charismatic uh, organisms that are out there. And so it's pretty important for us to understand that. And that is something that I would like to do more of in the future is study sort of the human impact. Well, and, and the reverse of that, right? How that the washing in of those human viruses also then comes back around. So what that cycle is for us. Nice, did that answer your question? Cool. Um, do, uh, this is from Max and Min, do viruses play a role in the evolution of organisms? Do they facilitate gene transfer between organisms that would otherwise not be able to share genetic material? Yeah, so there, so that's a really interesting question too. Um, so they definitely are what we call agents of horizontal gene transfer. Uh, they're very good at doing this, right? Because uh, there's certain parts about how they package themselves back up and create their progeny where they can pick up pieces of genetic material from the host that they're in now and then transfer that to a new host. Now, like I mentioned, oftentimes they're pretty specific, um, but you can even within a population have enough genetic diversity where it slowly starts to, well, it's slow, but it's faster than just natural genetic drift or other types of evolution so that you can more quickly uh, spread genetic material through them, yes. And so we often uh, study them to look at how they are impacting their host in terms of their evolution. So there's viruses that inject their uh, genetic material into the cell and then inject their genome into the host genome, right? Uh, we have viral genes in our genome. We have quite a few actually that have been embedded into our human genome and we call that well, sometimes it's called virome, but anyway, so we have lots of them. In fact, the reason uh, that we make a placenta 
is from an ancient viral gene. <laughs> All day long, right? It's so yes, that's right. That's, uh, that's, that's what's going on. So we have two more questions right now. Mika Bug wants to know, uh, um, okay. I, she must've watched our live feed because we were doing this on live feed. Uh, do you know about jellyfish? Do they live forever or can a virus kill them? I, I that's well, not really in your field. Could yeah, no. Is that, is that a Ben question? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe. It might be. I mean, I, I assume they have viruses. I don't know much about their viruses. I don't believe, I was just reading a paper actually recently about how they're still, I don't believe there's anything that they think that doesn't have a virus um, that either has been documented or, yeah. So I, I'm guessing they have viruses. They definitely don't live forever and I don't know the lifespan. So that would be better to maybe tag Ben and see if he know he might know a little bit more about their lifespan or at least a general lifespan. I'm gonna, My hunch is they, some might live for a while but some might not. You know, I always think of octopus. I thought, God, I, don't think, I love octopus. And I just thought they must live forever. They don't, they actually have really short lifespans. They, act, they actually, yeah, I, right. Um, and then uh, Maximin want to know, can viruses travel through water droplets, clouds, and streams? Uh, they do. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, they're like swimming through there, but they, they are uh, captured in aerosols. They're captured in rain. They're captured in particles. They're in any kind of water body that we've looked at. In fact, most ecosystems that have been examined have viruses, even the bottom of the ocean. So what's really crazy about that is I actually heard, well, from uh, uh, Tom, right, with nanocomposites that having a humidifier, having a little bit of humidity um, holds those viruses. Like it's good if you're in a room, of course you want wind, but humidity like holds those viruses. So that kind of speaks to that, right? Yes, yeah, so, right. There's many reasons why humidity works. Um, to act, Increasing the humidity in your home will decrease the amount of viral infections that you encounter day to day. Um, and that was a big study that came out a couple years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's amazing. So, how many boats, <laughs> how many boats, ships, submarines have you been on? Do you know that? Ooh, I don't. I've been on one submarine. I've used three different ROVs. So those are remote operated vehicles. They're like subs, but they're all controlled from the ship. Right, so they're tethered below the ship, and then the pilot is on board, um, piloting those. And then, ooh, I've been on ships multiple times too. So then that gets tricky. Um, so I can't even use the number of times I've been at sea. But I would oh, probably de definitely double digits, but I'm not exactly sure. Do you, Different ships. Do you get claustrophobic in a submarine? You know, I didn't um, at all. I was more nervous about uh, seasickness. So I do get seasick, even though I go out all the time and I take a little seasickness medicine the night before, very important. And the morning of that I go, and then sometimes one more day to get my sea legs. And then I usually am okay. Um, but I will, cause, you know, I don't really go out on ships every day. So I don't have constant sea legs. But when you go in a sub, when you drop down into the water, you're bobbing there for a while while the pilot is getting situated, while we're getting situated, and it's a bob. You know, you're just riding the waves until you can get below the ocean. So just below those waves, and then it's steady and it's so nice and everything. But that's what I was more nervous about is that when we got into the water, you bob for quite a while, and then you bob even longer after you come up from the bottom of the ocean while you're waiting for the rescue, the rescue boats. But the boats come out and they tether to the sub, and then you know they finally bring it on the giant A-frame onto the back of the ship. But that that's what was the worst. <laughs> Every other time, but all the other stuff was amazing. I mean, so, you, and I, you and I both know because we've talked about this. So I was a firefighter and I jumped out of helicopters with a chainsaw and I get really motion sickness. And the helitac, that's what their, their helicopter pilot's name or helitac, they would like do that because they knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so one more question and uh, then we're going to go to Ben. Have you ever studied a virus which can infect tardigrades? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Aren't they cool? No, I have not. Um, you know, uh, Angela, who I think is going to be on later, right? I and, believe. And Angela yeah. and Dr. Molly are bo both about the worm, <laughs> right? So she brought some samples back, and I remember there being tardigrades in there. We should have actually sequenced their um, microbiome and virome to see what was associated with them, but we did not. I know that would have been a good idea. Didn't she bring them back? I'm pretty sure she did, but ask, yeah, see if she does. And she might know more about if they have viruses and if they've been studied too. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa. Um, if you're able to hang out, that would be great. Um, or you could pop in and out. Um, so now we're going to move on. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We really appreciate you. Um, so now we're going to move on to Ben Frabel. Ben is uh, the collection manager at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He studies fishes. Every single thing he does is classified. I don't know why that's always funny to me, Ben, but it is. It'll always be funny to me forever. Um, he explores and identifies fishes of the deep from the Coral Sea. Um, and during this time, if you guys have not seen his YouTube, I'm going to put it in the chat right now for you guys to see after his talk. Let me see. Uh, boom, did that work? Well, I will in a second. Um, welcome, Ben. We're really glad uh, to have you here. Everybody say hi, Ben. Hey. hey. Um, as a reminder, between each talk, I'll let you guys know this is being recorded. We're going to post this later. Um, we want to give a shout out uh, to our host, the Steam Festival 2021.com. That's S T A M Festival 2020. One.com. Um, ben, welcome. Um, it was great to uh, make your YouTube video. I'm actually going to post that for people to see. Hopefully you guys uh, saw it prior to this talk. I know we already have questions for you, um, but I let everybody at the chat know that um, if they're here, we're going to ask their questions. Um, boom. Did I do it yet? Oh, come on. We're trying to post your in there. Oh, no. Back to me. Okay. Oh, well. Welcome, Ben. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, I'm the uh, collection manager of the Marine Vertebrate Collection at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So pretty much um, I'm a fish biologist or uh, the more technical term is an ichthyologist. Ichthy as in, you know, like fish in Greek. Um, but uh I, may, I pretty much manage, uh, you can think of it like as a, a library, but instead of books, it's pre, uh, preserved fish specimens. So we have about 2 million um, preserved fishes from all over the world, about 6,000 different species um, in probably about 140,000 or so jars. And uh, we make that accessible to researchers and teachers and folks like Jean and artists and all sorts of people all over the world. Very cool. So uh, a lot of people have watched your uh, YouTube and um, have been to some of your other chats as well. Um, so we have a lot of questions to get to. Uh, so I'm going to start off with Henry Woltz would like to know, um, oh, okay, I want to I want to study fish. I can name all of the types of fins, which I, I called them all fins. I'm, I'm, I don't know how <laughs> many awesome. there are, but maybe you could tell us. Uh, he'd like to know, do you know which fish has the most fins? Uh, yeah, so this is, that's kind of a, it's an interesting one because there are structures that we call finlets, which are kind of like smaller structures um, that some fish have that assist with like fine scale movement. So if you consider those fins, Fishes like tuna and wahoo, some of these big oceanic fish actually have all these little finlets towards the end of their, their, their body. And so if you count those, they could have like 20 or 30 fins. Um, there's another fish, a freshwater fish called the biker or Bashir, depending on how you want to pronounce it. They're really cool. Um, I don't have a picture of one with me right now, but uh, they're kind of these elongate eel looking fishes. And they also have a rows of lots of little fish, uh, fin, finlets, and they have about 17 of those if I remember correctly. Um, but if we're talking about regular fins, um, probably something in the cod family or hake family, because they have, most fish have mo at most two dorsal fins, but some of the hakes and cods actually have three dorsal fins and they can also have two anal fins, which are their fins on the bottom of their body. So you, you know, Ben, that I like bugs, right? So, you know, I love like the dragonfly because it can fly backwards like a helicopter, right? So the, all these different fins. I love Henry's question, by the way. Henry's seven. Oh, it's a great question. Um, so is, is that the different fins, like kind of like the dragonfly, like do different things, make them go in different directions, slow them down, or is that how they all work? 
Uh, I think it kind of depends on on the fish. So you know, for for these large pelagic fishes like these big swimmers, like like tuna and wahoo and stuff like that, um, it's thought that the the little finlets on their their the near the back of their body kind of help with fine scale movement when they're going really fast. So think of like you know, say like a spoiler on the back of a like a sports car. You know, it has like those little wings on the back that kind of help keep it, get, uh, you know, keep it down on the ground and provide a little bit of drag. And so it's thought these finlets kind of help with that, make it the fish a little more, uh, I guess what you would say is hydrodynamic. It's kind of like aerodynamic, but in water, you know, um, and allow for this fine scale maneuvering. But in fish like cod and, you know, in, in these, the biker, I'm not really sure what they're using all those extra fins for. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> they're like, we just have extra fins. Maybe it's because, yeah. you know. <laughs> but yeah, biker are a pretty prehistoric group. So, so you know, they they may have evolved all these fins for defense at some point in the their history, their lineage, and and uh, just stuck with it. Very cool. So, from Grace Depaz, uh, thank you for your question. Why do some fish fly? Oh, and do they catch bugs like bats? Is that why they fly? <laughs> a bug friend like me? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the primary fish that we think of are flying fish. When we think about fish getting out of the water, um, they're not actually flying. They're actually more gliding. So what the flying fish is able to do is generate a lot of propulsion with its caudal fin, its tail, um, and kind of work its way up. And then it breaks through the water surface. It has a really long kind of rudder on the back of its tail and kind of like does this and gets enough lift to put out its pectoral fins <laughs> and use those and also maybe sometimes the pelvic fins and use those to kind of stabilize it and glide out of the water. Now flying fish primarily use this as a predator avoidance technique. So they're using it to try to get away from, you know, something like a swordfish or a tuna or something that's chasing them. Because then once they get out of the water, it's hard for the tuna to figure out where they went and then they can kind of glide. Um, they usually don't glide very far. Um, kind of the average is about 40, 50 feet. Um, but people have clocked it up to a quarter mile. So depending on what the wind is doing. Um, and then they kind of land back in the water and hope that, you know, they got farther, far enough away that the tuna doesn't see them. So while they're gliding in the air, they're, they're not really doing this to try to find food. They're doing it to try to get away from predators. So I don't, I mean, I'm sure at some point in history, one maybe ran into a bug and ate a bug, but <laughs> I don't think they're, uh, a lot of times they don't, they don't fly with their mouths open because they actually hold a little bit of water inside their mouth um, while they're out, of, they're out of the water. That actually blows my mind. How far can they fly? Like, what's the furthest again? I think in a, there was a paper that was kind of measuring it, and the farthest I think they clocked it was a quarter mile. So I Just don't like, know the math of that one. So, but it's over a thousand feet. That is, that's <laughs> that's super. Like that's. But super in terms of vertically um, up in the air, usually that you know they're only probably about five to ten feet off the off the sea surface but they've, um, they've seen flying fish get caught in like a gust of wind. And so they've seen them go about 20 or 30 feet in the air, <laughs> which I don't think the fish really enjoyed. <laughs> That's in, that, is, that is really, really incredible. So I uh, got the opportunity to come and see your fish collection, fishes collection, by the way. Um, and it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and so I saw a fish that inspired, was inspired the movie, is it Alien? The, what was that fish that does this? The uh, predator, predator. Oh yeah, the, the, the sarcastic fringe head. Sarcastic fringe yeah, I can, hashtag. Sarcastic fringe head, yeah, it's a very funny name from the 1800s, I don't know. They thought the fish looked kind of like, when it has its mouth closed, and I guess back in the day, they would say that was a sarcastic look. Right, because it, it doesn't look very sarcastic, it looks a little scary, but it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you a question. This was asked earlier. And so Lisa and I thought it would be a good question, a better question for you. And I'm not really sure it's not exactly in there, but maybe. Um, do you know about jellyfish? Can they live forever? And do you, well, and then can, can a virus kill them? That's why I went to Lisa because they were asking if a virus can kill the immortal jellyfish. And are, I guess to you, are jellyfish immortal? <laughs> well, uh, I don't really do much with invertebrates. I did take marine invertebrate zoology in, in college, but about 10 years ago. Um, I guess this idea that jellyfish and other, other um, 
kind of fish that go through, or fish, sorry, other invertebrates that go through this polyp stage. Um, the idea that they're Im immortal is kind of comes from their reproductive biology where, so you have a jellyfish and kind of how it reproduces, some species reproduces, they produce what are called polyps. They kind of, they honestly look like a little sea anemone or like a little coral polyp um, that bud off of them. And then those grow into other jellyfish. So you can think of them, I guess, as immortal because they're kind of constantly, you know, making new ones, but it's not the same individual that's staying, you know, uh, that way forever. So I guess it depends on how you define immortality. How, how it's it's all in perception. It's how, how you how it would be like me continuing to clone myself and saying that I'm immortal because I have all these clones, <laughs> sort of. Well, but I, I can't I can't speak to anything well, about Mr. them Smith. getting sick or viruses or anything like that. I don't know anything about that. I was like, hello, Mr. Smith. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. So, um, great. So I was really encouraged and loved your chat about how during this time, the pandemic, obviously somebody who explores um, and has to go out on boats to actually explore and discover new species. Um, I loved how you guys did that. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how you guys uh, took over it? And we also had a couple hashtags, by the way, uh, Luke Williams, Luke Williamson, and I, I didn't have an age on that, so I wasn't sure if it's somebody you knew, but they were like, hashtag go team fish, and then they had a whole bunch of hashtag go team fishes, so I guess you started that hashtag with, so if you could tell us a little bit about how you uh, kept going during the pandemic. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, it was just kind of, you know, we found out there's a couple different organizations that have these underwater robots called ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, that have really nice camera systems, but the boats have really amazing um, satellite technology where they're able to connect and stream uh, directly from these underwater robots because they're connected to a cable and then they have these nice, uh, you know, receivers up at the surface. Um, so this has been going on for years. The US government has one called Okeanos. This one was run by the Schmidt Oce uh, Oceanographic Institute, which is a, uh, a private uh, organization. And then there's another one uh, called the Nautilus that's also private. Um, so people online have been watching these. They stream them on YouTube usually. It's really fun. Um, they're usually exploring places nobody's ever really seen the deep ocean. But you know, last about this time last year, we saw on Twitter that they were saying they're gonna do some stuff in the Coral Sea. Um, I do some work on coral reef fishes, so we got pretty excited because they said they were going to, um, you know, do do it kind of more in the coral coral uh, related depths of that area. Um, and so we logged in kind of on the first dive and started watching it with my my couple of my colleagues. Um, and very quickly, the, the the people who organized the researchers who organized it, uh, Robin uh, Beeman, Dr. Robin Beeman at James Cook University, and other folks were really interested in geological features and also benthic invertebrates, like some of the coral and stuff in this picture behind me. Um, but they weren't, they didn't really know too, too much about the fish and they weren't paying that much attention, but they were also, it was a kind of an open-ended project. They just kind of threw this together because of the, the pandemic and the rapid availability of that boat. So we were able to kind of, they have a live chat on the YouTube. And so we just kind of got in that chat and started identifying fish and not just myself, but you know, there was a whole bunch of people and not all scientists, people that are just aquarium hobbyists who are really interested in the fishes, you know, it's, it's a lot of really beautiful coral reef fish. And so very quickly, it kind of started to take over the chat a little bit <laughs> and they called it team fish um, and, or the fish army. I think they also referred to it as just cause we kind of started talking and then um, they actually ended up bringing on my colleague, Ikai T at University of Sydney, um, kind of on as a, like, he would uh, come on and talk, like, to, to the public over the ROV footage and kind of say what they were seeing at, at certain spots and, and kind of actually got involved in, in the, um, the planning and that kind of stuff. So that was pretty cool. And so now we have all the videos, they're really high quality, they're, they're like 4K HD, super high quality. Um, and so it's now a very slow process of us slowly going through these videos and making sure we're counting and looking at every single fish that we, they saw. And we're putting together a big list of all the fish that were seen in the deep coral sea. And so it was really cool is that the deep coral sea hadn't really been explored before this. So, you know, we were seeing some fish that weren't known from there. We also saw a bunch of new species like undescribed 
described species that, you know, unfortunately we didn't collect any, so we can't describe them, but we can publish pictures of them. And so maybe in the future, if somebody gets a specimen, um, they can put a name on those new species. It was, it's a really great project um, that, that, you know, was perfect for the pandemic because none of us had to travel away from our, uh, our living rooms. I just, I love that story. I, I love all of the uh, rainbow stories that are coming out for during the pandemic of the different kind of science and things that we're able to do. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I know this is not the focus of what you do, but, but, but I got to say it, hashtag show us the tooth. <laughs> yeah, so we, we have one <laughs> sorry, very man. sad, oops, uh-oh, there, I got to hold it in front of my face. This, this very sad megalodon tooth. People wanted to see a megalodon tooth. It's, it's not in very good shape. Uh, it was kind of donated to our collection at some point just by, by, by somebody who, who found it in their house. Um, I don't know where it came from. Based on the color, this gray color, you tend to find in the southern, southeastern United States, in North Carolina, um, Maryland, those types of places. So it may have come from there. But yeah, this is a pretty nice size, but not in very good quality Megalodon tooth. So, um, Ben, you are absolutely, totally always a joy and amazing amount of information. Um, we could, we could like do an entire uh, thing today. Um, thank you so much for coming by. Um, if you can uh, stay around, uh, tap in or tap out. I'm sure that we'll, you know, have more questions. Um, next, we're going to have up uh, Dr. Sunny Bugate. Um, everybody say thank you, Ben. Woo! Um, Thanks. See you guys. So again, to begin this, we want to give a shout out to the STEAM Festival 2021.com. Thank you so much uh, for putting this on this year. Just to remind everybody, we are recording this. So this is going to be recorded so that everyone can see it a little bit later if they'd like to. Um, this is the post chat chat. So hopefully you guys have gone to the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers YouTube and watched the YouTube of these incredible scientists and engineers, found out a little bit about what they've been working on during this pandemic on, and where they're going and then have some questions for them. Dr. Sunny, my friend, how are you? Hey, pretty good, Gene. How are you? You guys, guess where we are right now? You see Dr. Sunny right there? That's the Thunderdome, the Cyber Thunderdome. I love that. So Dr. Uh, Sunny Fugate, uh, he works with the Navy Research Science Naval Information Warfare Center for Biologically Cyber Defense. So you use defensive mimicry. And I was kidding uh, with some kids before. I don't know that it's complete kidding though. Basically your job, you know how all kids are like, I want to game. That's, I'm going to be a gamer. When I grow up, I'm going to be a gamer, right? I mean, it's kind of what you do, but on a way bigger mm -hmm. scale, right? A little bit? Depends, it depends on how you think about it. I mean, some of the games today are pretty amazing in terms of scale and scope and immersion. Um, we are trying to come up with ways of defending systems, computers um, and people and information by playing games with attackers. So we want attackers to sort of be confused about um, what's real and what's not, um, what systems they can attack or what systems they shouldn't attack. Um, and one of the sort of key insights that we've had is that if you just present to an attacker the idea that there might be deception and there might be games that the defender is playing with them, then all of a sudden, rather than just attacking systems right away, they have to step back and ask the question like, am I playing a game? Am I in a simulation? Is someone, is someone messing with me? Um, and then they're spending all this time trying to figure out what's real and what's a decoy. Um, what can I get away with now? Um, or should I just leave? Which would be a huge win for defenders. So if we can convince the attacker that it's, it's too hard, um, then that's, that's the best scenario. Then they're voluntarily exiting uh, and then our networks are, are better defended. Incredible. So just to remind all of you guys, you guys can ask us questions inside the chat. I do have questions that classrooms, teachers, and kids sent me ahead of time. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're recording so people can go back and see this and see some of their um, answers, but feel free to come in here and ask questions. Uh, so you ready for your first question, Sonny? Yeah, please, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so Noah Diaz, <laughs> um, Noah Diaz wants to know, can I come work for you when I'm 18? How does one uh, become an employee of Dr. Sonny Fugate? 
That's a good question. We actually have a really great internship program that is also available for high school students. So you don't even have to be 18 to do some of the kinds of work that we, we do. Um, so that is the SEIP program. I think that's SEIP through the Office of Naval Research. Uh, and I can probably find a link and put it in the chat. Um, we also have the NREAP program, which is for college age students. Uh, and that's a really great way of, of sort of working for any um, Navy you know, organization or lab. Um, so apply for one of those programs if you're interested uh, and you're, uh, you wanna do work in the, that relates to the things that the Navy uh, touches on, which is really broad. We, we go from the seabed to space in terms of like scale and scope of the kinds of research. Um, and so I do cyber research, but there's folks that do radio telecommunications work, satellite communications work. There's folks that look at um, underwater vehicles, aerial vehicles. Uh, we have an autonomous boat um, uh, called the Sea Hunter um, that's really cool. Um, there's all kinds of really cool engineering and science, you know, ongoing. Um, I have, you know, sort of the niche that that uh, that I work in, but there's lots of other work. Great. So Noah is SEIP. He's going to put it in the chat uh, before he leaves today. So make sure you look back at the chat and let your friends know. You don't have you don't have to wait. It sounds like you you know you can do some stuff right now. Um, and also uh, you can you can go through us if you guys also want to send an email to Gene Wong LXS at Gmail and ask other questions from here about how to do that, please feel free. Brooke Killsby, <laughs> I already know the answer to this. There's very rare when somebody asks a question that I actually know the answer to, believe it or not. Um, PC or Mac? <laughs> that's, that's a loaded question, Gene. Um, <laughs> right? So one of the things that, that people sort of tend to, to think is that Macs are more secure. Um, and that's really not the case. There's no fundamental difference in the security of most systems. They're all based on the same hardware um, and a lot of the same principles of design. Um, one of the benefits of using a platform like the Mac is that there are fewer of them. There's simply less of them. And so from an attacker's perspective, there's, there's less value in finding attacks against Mac systems because there's so few compared to the large numbers of PCs. Um, so even though there's millions of millions and millions hundreds of millions of Mac systems out there, um, there's a far greater number of PC systems. And that means that you are a little maybe even more secure just because attackers are not as interested. Um, uh, other aspects that I like, I appreciate, are that the, the Mac is based upon Unix. Um, and that has some benefits in terms of flexibility and how we do research. So I tend to use Mac and Linux exclusively uh, for our research but we still use Windows systems because those are the systems that we're generally trying to protect. So we have to understand how those systems are designed, um, the kinds of flaws that can occur, um, how we can defend you know, against attacks against those flaws. I think that goes into the next question. I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm, uh, I listen, I'm not gonna pretend like I understand this question. I'm gonna read it and, and, then, and then you'll know. Carrie McGowan. Do you use other binary analysis tools other than Ghidra, hex rays, pi, panda, uh, chameleon? I'm probably hacking that, but do you understand um, yeah. the question? You probably, okay. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we are, uh, we've got teams of folks that uh, do vulnerability discovery and reverse engineering, uh, and they use you know various binary analysis tools. Um, the kind of the specific tool you use um, most likely depends upon your familiarity. So if you have great familiarity with hex rays um, or IDA uh, or one that we use often right now is called Ghidra, which was it's uh, a tool built by the National Security Agency that was uh, released as open source for the general public to use. Uh, and this is a really great toolkit that has all kinds of great capability. Um, and I like that one because it's free, right? It's free and open source. Um, and it's got great plugins for doing analysis of software. So absolutely, there's some really incredible tools out there. Uh, some of them are a little expensive, um, but there are some really great low cost solutions. And some of these are the best in class. So I highly recommend that if you haven't tried Ghidra yet, you should take a look. Uh, and I, I'll put the, uh, it says G-H-I-D-R-A, Ghidra. Um, I was hoping I said that right. I was like, it must be that. I did, good. 
they have a great logo too. It's a it's a it's a dragon in the form of a uh, infinity symbol. Um, and again, that whole that whole section, uh, even the question, my mind was blown because I was like, wait, oh yeah, all right, cool, very very cool. All right, so um, we want to know a lot about how to be secure in this day and age. But before we go to that, oh, there we go. I was like, oh, uh, do you think that biohacking is the future of cyber warfare? Um, warfare. I'm thinking things like bomb sniffing dolphins or higher tech stuff like mapping the human brain. That's really, really cool. And it's a really great question. Um, and it touches on um, one of my vocational interests, which is cognitive science. And so one of the things that we have realized is that a lot of people think of cyber as like you have computer systems and the computer systems do whatever they do and you've got attackers and maybe they're using tools to automate their attacks. Um, and so you have this machine against machine sort of paradigm. Um, and there was a recent uh, DARPA cyber grand challenge where they did exactly that, where they, they pitted um, automated attackers against automated defenders, where a piece of software is trying to find defects in its own software identify those defects and patch them automatically. And then you've got attackers, automated attackers, um, no hands on keyboard, fully automated for the extent of the, the duration of the event. Um, teams are competing for, can I patch my systems faster than you? If I patch my systems and they go offline, then I, I'm, I, I get fewer points because my system's not available anymore. So, so there's a, there is a big push for, for machine automation. So using AI to guide cyber defenses uh, using machine learning to learn how to defend systems. But, but we should really be thinking about like, are we, when we defend a system, we're really trying to make a human's job easier. We're trying to make sure that their computer is still useful. And so we have to think about the human in terms of the defender. How can humans guide the, attack, the, the, the defenses? Uh, and as well as like when someone, when a, an attacker comes into a network, um, there's usually a, and a human behind that attack somewhere. And so, if we want them to give up, you know, sort of, um, you know, attacking that network, it's not so much that we have to just interfere with the technical mechanisms they use, the specific attacks, um, the tools they use. We also have to convince the human at the other end, like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be attacking this network. Maybe you need to leave. Um, so I think in that sense, there's definitely got to be a focus on um, on the biology, right, uh, on the cognition of humans and the perception of humans about that environment. Um, but I also love the sentiment that you know, biohacking uh, is, is fascinating to me. Um, if you've not read about or heard about the sort of biohacking villages at events like DEF CON, um, that's D-E-F-C-O-N, it's a large hacker convention. Uh, take a look because there are teams of folks that are looking into, you know, augmented perception, like how to make human perception better um, or how to, you know, augment the human body in really clever ways. Um, and that is, you know, kind of cool, but also kind of scary, right? Like, where are we going? Um, is it a post-human, is it gonna be a post-human world, you know, where, where in the future we actually are all cyborgs to some extent? Are we already cyborgs if we, we have a device that acts as, a, as an augmentation of our ability to perceive and interact with the world in terms of a mobile phone? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's very, very intriguing though, as like a sci-fi fan, right? Like I always look to all those movies and, you know, when is that someday going to be real? And have we surpassed a lot of that? Like I look at Star Trek, no, 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 no hating on Angela when she comes in, but I'm just saying like, I think we've met so much of what Star Trek had portrayed before as far as, you know, where are we going in the future? Virtual reality was a thing on Star Trek and it is absolutely here and people are using it you know my own kid has it like you know it's a it's a it's a thing that that people do I can't uh wait to see more of it um I was really um intrigued by the idea that you uh actually want you know not want but you're okay with people knowing exactly what defenses you're putting up because the more they challenge your defenses the stronger you can make them can you kind of speak to that a little bit right so um the, yeah the best defenses that we have today um probably come from the cryptographic community where they develop algorithms to encrypt data and those algorithms are strong and robust and can be shared with the attacker it doesn't matter 
um, because it's not about the algorithm and the method. Um, it's about the fact that you've got just a tiny bit of secret information that says, uh, you know, my system will be robust regardless, right, uh, of, of what you know about it. Um, and that is sort of the fundamental requirement for a strong defense. Um, so we test systems by sort of acting as adversaries, sort of simulating what an adversary would do. And we have to think creatively about what an adversary might try to do. Um, and that allows us to, you know, build a stronger system. If we never think adversarially, if we don't think like an attacker, um, there's no way for us to actually defend a system because we won't be able to think, you know, in the same manner. Um, adversaries don't follow the rules that we set for systems. By definition, they're sort of outside the box, right? Um, so absolutely, you know, we have to, uh, if we have systems that are exposed to the world and attackers are in there all the time, then if that system is still working, if it's still running, then we'll, by definition, we'll have to have bolstered as defenses. Um, now that said, there's risks in doing that. And that's one of the things that is a big part of my job today is, is convincing uh, folks to use novel defenses, to use um, zero trust models where I've got an open network and I don't trust any system. Um, I have to test, you know, sort of the interaction and communication between systems uh, in order to know whether or not like, our, is that system now under con the control of an attacker? Um, as opposed to you know, traditional thinking is that as long as you keep everything inside your network protected, then everything's good and you have an implicit trust between uh, systems. So there's, yeah, there's, some, there's some really great you know, work being done in the commercial world, um, really great implementations of this kind of zero trust model. Uh, and definitely we wanna think adversarially when we build and design, uh, deploy, configure, and maintain systems. Very, very cool. Um, while we still have you here, and I hope you can stay for a little bit or at least come back to the end, can you give us some tips and tricks, uh, some safety tools that uh, we can use in this more, like, you know, we're all way, way more connected. I mean, I thought we were really connected, but during COVID, we became like super connected really fast. So how do we really quickly catch up and uh, try to make us as safe as possible? Uh, there's a few really quick things you can do. Um, keep your systems up to date. So patch, 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 like make sure you're up to date. Use a password manager. So don't, you shouldn't have to remember any, any more than one or two passwords. The rest should go into a secure password manager. Um, Google Chrome has one built in. Uh, the Apple uh, keychain iPhone has one built in. One pass, there's lots of these available. Um, other things you might be able to do is do a little bit of like cyber gardening, go and pull the weeds. So remove the apps you're not using. If it's a game you install, you no longer play, delete it. Uh, if it's an app that you know you installed just for communicating that one time, remove it. Um, and then go back and check the preferences for these things. Make sure they have the minimum pr pr privilege um, that, that they need to do what you need them to do. So if you wanted to share a photo one time to Facebook, um, then you had to give it access to your whole library of photos. So, but if you don't want to share photos with them anymore, you turn that off, right? They don't need access to your photos or your location. Um, so go back and fix those settings. Do that periodically, right? Whenever you think of it, be like, hey, you know, maybe this app, you know, has too much information. Or if an app starts sending you notifications, um, maybe turn those notifications off. Like, hey, stop bugging me. And at the same time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away permissions from you. So things like that will make, make everyone a lot safer. Um, just a couple principles, right? Like keep your data safe, make sure you use secure passwords um, and do some gardening. Very, very cool. We wanna thank you uh, so much for being here. Um, we're waiting on our next guest uh, who isn't in our chat yet. So I'm kind of uh, hanging out a little bit. Um, we want to remind everybody here we are recording this so that you guys can see this post you guys can look at uh sunny's youtube uh, about the chat that he did he has some really great tips and trips for you guys to use right now um, those of you guys that are using into the chromebooks and everything else that you're doing right now regardless if you're virtual or not virtual um, and uh, we want to give a shout out again to the steam festival 2021 dot com um hold on i'm getting a message oh yeah you're very very welcome thank you so you guys remember to ask all of your questions in the chat uh we have a list of questions that we were sent in um about different people that are coming into here 
uh, about different things that are going on. Um, we are getting ready to gear up for some summer programs. So we hope that you guys keep tuned in to the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers, where we're going to be doing a lot of different uh, summer activities. And you guys can tune in to our scientists and engineers when we're doing that as well. So soon, Sunny, we're going to be talking to uh, Jasmine and we're going to be talking to Angela. Um, so I just want to give a preview while we're waiting for them to come in. Look, you guys, look. You know what that is? Okay, so any of you guys that follow the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers, you, you know why this is kind of funny. Because Angela and I have a little bit of a rivalry between she really likes Star Trek and I like Star Wars. However, Angela got published. Okay, and so my favorite character in Star Wars is Boba Fett. Angela got published in the Star Wars magazine with the Boba Fett cover for her extremophile explorers. And so she's inside of this magazine. So all of it comes full circle. Always wait for the win. It'll come around. That's exactly uh, what's gonna go down. Let's see if I can get, oh, there we go. Almost guys. All right, this is how when we do this live, right? We're gonna ask them to come in right now. Admit. Cool. All right. One second. All right. Oh, there we go. There's Jasmine. Hey, Jasmine. Hey, Jasmine. Hello. Hi, Mama. So good to see you. Good to see you. I was like, Jasmine's going to be here soon. Yes, I'm here. I'm in class too right now. So in my doctorate in education. Oh, very cool. Very, very nice. So uh, Jasmine Sadler is the MBA engineer, CEO, the future STEAM University owner of Engineers and Perspective on Diversity. I hope you guys uh, looked at her YouTube. She's also a math tutor. She is the engi an engineer that helped develop engines. So if you guys go uh, check out her YouTube video, she's doing a whole bunch of stuff. She's really busy. I have. I have done a whole lot of things. I'm trying to do less things now, but yes. <laughs> Yes, I, well, I keep saying that too, right? Every time I have like a, a, a millimeter, right? We, uh, <laughs> we, we go right back in there. So uh, a lot of people have watched your YouTube video and we already have some questions that were sent in for you. So I just kind of want to get right into it yeah. and ask you some of the questions um, that uh, kids have for you. Christian LaShawn wants to know, oh, okay. Um, what math should I learn in high school before college to be an engineer? Yeah, so engineer is a whole lot of math, um, especially I did aerospace engineering. So we had to take three levels of calculus, um, another class called differential equations. And then I also took more math than that because I ended up getting a math minor while I was in school because I was already doing so much math and because I love math too. Um, but in high school, I ended up taking, I wanna say like advanced algebra, trigonometry, a geometry, and then I did AP calculus. So that's what I had my senior year in high school. And then after taking the AP calculus exams, if, if some of the students don't know this out there, that AP is advanced placement. So it's almost like you're taking a college class or you can get the college credit while you're still in high school. So it's still a high school class, uh, but you can get the credit for it. So at the end of the class, you take an exam, an AP, an advanced placement exam. And then so since I scored high enough on that exam, I was able to skip a class when I went to college. So that's one less class that my parents or anybody would have had to pay for when I went to college. Yeah, so that's uh, taking some of the classes in high school really help out in college, right? 
Um, did you did you have a counselor that really helped guide you through that or a teacher that helped guide you through that? Because I know a, a lot of kids that's kind of, you know, like they, you know, they need somebody to help guide them, right? Like someone like you. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes um, you don't always get the encouragement and the guidance from your counselors. For me, it was mostly, well, since I was already in honors classes, then they kind of recommended certain classes for me. I know the main thing we had to do in high school was take at least four years of math though, but they didn't tell us which ones. So you get to choose which math you take, or well, at least I did. So to be able to push for the hardest ones or the ones that would potentially get me out of the college class before I even got to college, sometimes you have to speak up and advocate for yourself, even if your counselor doesn't recommend that for you. But if you know that an AP class exists, even if it's not in math, if it's in any other subject, then you can also tell them what to put on your, on your schedule, even though um, they may not recommend that for you already. Right, so we also, um... That's really, really good advice. I really did want to balance this. And another kid asked this question, which because I know you and I, and I love you so much, I love this question. Um, Tony Kirk wants to know, <laughs> do you have a dance troupe? It's a, I think it's a two-part question. Um, are you or would you like to be a, a, a prima ballerina? Mm -hmm. And also, I like math too. Oh, very cool. So I hope you like dance and you like math. So that was the case for me. I danced in high school, but then I was also in AP calculus. So when I went to college, I found a dance team to participate in while I was in college too. So I was an engineer and then at night we would have practice and sometimes we would dance on campus or dance at festivals or different things like that. So um, you can still do both of those. Um, but when I had to decide what do I want to major in in college, I had to choose at the time between dance and engineering. Which one do I want to major in? Or some people may major in both. Um, but since they're two completely different colleges, I would have had to take classes like English, a foreign language, different things like that for my dance major that I wouldn't have had to take for my engineering major. So I ended up deciding to do engineering and then just dancing with my friends, um, you know, after class was over and in the evening. So that's one way to do it. But as Jean mentioned earlier, that my plan is to own and run a STEAM university so that students wouldn't have to choose between the two. You can always be an artist and a STEM major, a science, technology, engineering, or math major while you're an artist. So even if you sing or paint or dance or draw, um, that's, those skills can go together. They, don't, they shouldn't be separated uh, because then it makes it really hard for people like you who love dance and love math. So Tony, do both, do all of it, right? All of it. Cutting, cross cutting, <laughs> cross cutting. We always, we always say that uh, the whole kid, the whole person, the whole human, right? All of the things um, that absolutely feed us. And uh, hopefully that you guys all know, uh, before you leave today, Jasmine, if you could put uh, the STEAM Collaborative and any links that you want into our chat for people to follow, we're gonna be recording this and having that there. So uh, Jasmine is also the CEO of the STEAM Collaborative that brings uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and math together um and uh help all of those people speak uh, uh make bridges across them to do amazing things throughout the community she's also an incredible math tutor and i am sure would give excellent guidance uh uh to you christian <laughs> that would like to know which math you should uh be taking if you're able to choose in high school i Obviously, I wasn't that great in math, so I don't even I didn't even know you could choose what math you're taking <laughs> in high school. That wasn't even like on my radar. So that was like, you could choose what math you have in high school. Is that do you like I don't I was like, can you or yeah, I mean, and sometimes having a good math tutor would help you with that too, because just like there's different types of science, like biology, which is like studying the body and then chemistry about studying 
chemicals and uh, physics, which is what I had to do a lot of in aerospace engineering. I didn't have to do a lot of chemistry and a lot of biology, but I had to do a whole lot of physics, which is about like gravity and things moving. Um, so yeah, things not moving and things moving is uh, what physics is all about. And so understanding the differences about science, but then also understanding the differences of math. So when you talk about geometry, that's like shapes and some of those angles that are within the shapes and some of the lengths of things. And then, um, and so then you have like calculus, which is about like areas under curves. And so if you wanna represent something to be like, to look like a line um, or look like a U or so if you have a glass of water, um, this shape, and so sometimes you simulate what this shape looks like. And so that's when you need calculus. Um, and then when you're looking at the volume of something that's inside of a shape like this, um, how much can this be estimated as if I said, this is a straight line, this is a straight line, and this is a straight line, that's where you need calculus. And so sometimes a tutor can also help you through that understanding what the different mass actually mean, and then what the different types of science actually mean. And then those are the ones that, depending on what you wanna do in life, those are the ones that you should know how to do probably better. And then also when I tutor, I'm like some of this stuff you won't need to know for the next class, but you just really need to know that for this test. So let's get you to know that for this test. <laughs> and then you're gonna find out how to do this way easier next time. So even like multiplication. So initially when you're learning how to add and you're like, okay, two plus two plus two, two, four, six. But then in the next class, you learn multiplication, which is two times three. So in this class, you need to know two plus two plus two, but in the next class, you can just do two times three. So those are all kinds of things that a math tutor should be able to help you with that, you know, your teacher may not really sit down with you to talk you through those things. That is amazing. I know you are incredibly busy on so many different fronts from um, engineering to uh, going to school to teaching to being a CEO. Please drop all of those links um, into our chat. I'd really appreciate it. And I also know that you're in here from Denver. What's up? You're in Detroit. 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 Sorry. Detroit. 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 Yeah. That's yes. right. Uh, so she came to us uh, from Detroit in her class. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for being here. I super always, always appreciate you being here. Drop in some links. Oh, wait, what college classes should I take if I want to become an actuary? That's a really cool job. So what do you know about what an actuary does? Uh, they're about the numbers. Well, um, I was asking... Um, what I know is that they calculate risk assessments for insurance companies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing. And so I don't, you probably know more about actually being an actuary than I do. And so one of my good friends who did engineering, she actually did electrical engineering, but wanted to go back to school and learn more about finance and numbers to become an actuary. So there were, actually some classes that weren't in college that she was planning to do. And so do you know about, there's like an actuary exam that you have to take? Yeah, and so those classes don't always happen in college. So some of those majors, you can major in whatever or something that you're really interested in in college, um, maybe finance, but maybe it could be industrial engineering or, um, you know, so there can be a lot of different fields that you can major in. And then outside of taking a college class on a certain thing, you can have other education, which is also equally as valid. And then you can take those exams to be an actuary. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, do what you're interested in, do what you love. And yeah, some things like that. Also like project management can kind of overlap in some of that where you can have a completely different major in college and then go to school for you know maybe a year and become a project manager. So, um, but yeah, it sounds like you're, you're already interested and have been looking into it a bit, but yeah, I definitely encourage since you know it's a lot of numbers, it's a lot of forecasting about things in the future, finance, that's what finance is all about. So understanding kind of the difference in those maths, like accounting and finance, they're 
both a lot of numbers, they're both a lot of money, but they mean different things. Um, so still, when you have that knowledge, then you can better understand what kinds of classes fit becoming an actuary. That's a great question. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Jasmine. If you could drop all those links in our chat uh, for STEAM Collaborative, for your tutoring, for everything, uh, <laughs> I, everything that you do. I have a link tree, so I'll just plant the whole tree in there. I love <laughs> I love you so much, so, so love much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now up is going to be Angela Zomplis, uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, she's an extremophile explorer from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Craig Venter Institute. Uh, if they can make it here, they can make it anywhere. Uh, she's been to Antarctica multiple times. Um, and we already have some questions. I hope you guys have seen her YouTube video that she's made. Um, and then we'll have some great facts and stuff about her as well. Hi, Angela, how are you? How's it going? Yeah, it's going good. I love your background. Is that- Sweet. Is it Mars? Do you know where it is? Mars? Is it Mars? No. Oh. <laughs> you know, like, good try. Yeah, you know, where's the big brain on Gene? There it's no. uh, it, it Itzel is one of the biggest brains in here. I, I give a shout out to Itzel. <laughs> she's like, she's been asking the uh, great, 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 great questions. Awesome. So I really uh, enjoy doing your video with you. Um, and I actually learned, I mean, I've known you for a very long time. And on that day, uh, this month, like I was literally like this, the whole, I was like, wait, what? What? Oh. <laughs> what? Uh, so if you guys have not seen her YouTube, Oh, Arrakis, is that right? It is, this is Titan. So that's Saturn, right? And then Titan is one of, I tried to throw everybody off, I guess. Titan is one of the, I guess, lesser, lesser known. It's, a, it's the moon, right? Uh, but Titan is a moon, yeah. yeah. I know the moon. I know like, yeah. you know, like is it a moon? <laughs> it is a moon. Very good, Gene. You got that right. Definitely a moon. Well, let's do my uh, Star Wars things. If you guys don't know our our rivalry between Angela and I of Star Trek to Star Trek. <sighs> you know what's great? I'm going to be on a Star Trek or, or no, sorry. Oh my God. I just got it wrong. I'm going to be on a Star Wars podcast right after this. So, what? Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, I got to try to get it. was published in this magazine that she's going to sign for me by the way about <laughs> extremophiles. So you study extremophiles, things that Really, I mean, it's hard for them to um, live in places. Right, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, my, I mentioned this in my talk, my, my work um, stemmed out of the Dry Valleys, which is this uh, remote place in Antarctica uh, that's largely ice-free. Um, and, and so it kind of looks like the surface of Mars. Um, they do a lot of, NASA does a lot of mission testing over there, drilling, um, because it is very much a Martian analog, which just means it's it's very similar to Mars um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, and then, you know, on, on top of that, we find a little bit of life that survives there, um, which is which is extremely cool, um, just because you're you're kind of pushing the barriers of what we know life to survive in in terms of you know extreme conditions. Yeah. Right. So um, like uh, water bears. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We find uh, tardigrades, which are the cutest uh, in the community. Right. Um, uh, yeah. We were talking about tardigrades earlier. Right. Yeah. We were uh, yeah. talking. She's like, Angela would know more about that if uh, um, there's ever been a virus that has infected tardigrades. Because aren't they like they're everywhere? I defer to Lisa for that. I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there. You know, we do see viruses, um, you know, in our in our uh, genomic data, right? But whether or not they infect tardigrades, right? That that I don't know yet. Yeah, that, that would be a very interesting thing. Are they resistant to everything? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So a a couple of things that I learned that I thought was really crazy is the adaptation that extremophiles have, like really crazy adaptations. Like yeah. they have proteins that can stop ice. Right. Yeah. Ice binding proteins. Right. Or, you know, otherwise antifreeze proteins. Right. Yeah. 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 So I thought that that was was really, really incredible. 
And then something else that I know. So I'm going to ask you this question that was sent in to us. Are you ready for this question? Maybe. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. All right. So this question uh, was sent in to us from um, Aria Fishman. All life needs photosynthetic food base. Thus, it needs light. Fight me. <laughs> That's a hashtag. Sounding a bit villain. It sounds like it's either like a villain or my mom. Like that fight me gives it away. Fight me. I'm like, all right. Wow. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, look, so, you know, for, for definitely for life on earth, um, a lot of life on earth, especially complex life, like we all know, right, um, large complex ecosystems, a lot of life depends on, um, you know, that base of, of photosynthetic algae plants. Um, for consumption and energy, right? Uh, that's that's what we know on, uh, you know, for, uh, again, a lot of life on earth depends on sunlight, right? Our, our, a lot of our ecosystems are based around that. Um, what we do find though, which is really exciting. And so in 2002, uh, there was a, a science group that went to uh, Idaho and under these mountains were these uh, hot springs, right? And so there was absolutely no light, right? Devoid of sunlight. Um, so again, you know, these are, you know, some of the places in the world before these research uh, projects were considered, you know, dead or no life. And why are you even going there for biology? You shouldn't, um, right? But so they ended up finding archaea uh, called methanogens, right? And so these methanogens were kind of, I don't know if that maybe the maybe the first uh, known in or you know things that do not need sunlight right so they got all their energy from uh, inorganic compounds right so there was a flux of hydrogen gas uh, and carbon dioxide and that's all they needed um so how exciting you know to you know see these different types of metabolisms and then to realize you know that we we might have underestimated a lot of places in the world that you know we we once thought were void of life um but then can sustain these uh, you know, very simple life, you know, keep in mind, archaea, you know, um, you know, are, are thought to be some of the earliest known um, living organisms, right? Um, very simple life, very simple metabolism. Um, but then, you know, when we look at other places like the deep sea uh, that, you know, where, where sunlight has a hard time reaching, uh, you know, these places, um, we do find, you know, pretty big ecosystems based off of bacteria that are not using light, but using uh, organic and in, or inorganic chemi uh, chemicals for their energy, right? And then supporting things like giant tube worms, um, these little yeti crabs, right? So, so we do find whole little ecosystems based off of, uh, you know, chemotrophic rather than phototrophic uh, life. Right? So. so, so ketotrophic versus phototrophic, they're two totally different things. Um, and there, right, are, yeah. there are ketotrophic things on our planet. Because right, chemotrophic things exist on our planet, right? And and do they exist elsewhere is, is the, the million dollar question, you know. Um, you know, a lot of like, for example, this Titan, right? Titan is a moon of Saturn. Um, it gets 1% of sunlight that we would get on earth, right? So either things are, are uh, processing very, very low levels of light or they rely on, uh, you know, all these clouds are, are filled with, uh, again, hydrogen gas or, or uh, you know, carbon dioxide, methane, every, a lot of different chemicals that we know can support life, um, you know, in the absence of sunlight. Right. So, so very exciting things. Um, so it's also, you know, I, I will say too, you know, what, what's also been discovered too is in these hydrothermal vents, right? There's, there's not much sunlight, but hydrothermal vents can also produce low, low, low levels of light by minerals just being heated up and, and sparking. And then some organisms can use their photosynthetic capabilities to process that light, which is like, you know, almost nothing. But they're still like, oh, light, you know. So it's not sunlight, but maybe other sources of light. So hydrothermal vents, really, um, you know. Again, you have these minerals that, you know, are reacting uh, to high heat and sometimes split and and fracture and produce these low levels of light. Um, which then, you know, some organisms like the the green sulfur bacteria down there uh, can then photosynthesize. So, you know, even places in no light that may have hydrothermal vents, right? So Europa, for example, has this huge you know, thick ice sheet that, you know, the ocean underneath wouldn't necessarily have light, but maybe they have hydrothermal vents and maybe they're getting low levels of light um, along with, you know, other, again, 
you know, chemotrophic metabolisms too. So. I mean, chemotrophic, ha hashtag mind blown, mind blown. I, I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking Something. about. So you don't necessarily need light. You can like, you know, you can... <laughs> Right. Yeah. You don't, you don't necessarily need sunlight. Uh, you don't necessarily need light. Uh, but you know, again, for, for, you know, that, that is, you know, I, this is, um, you know, when we look at perspective of what we see on earth, right. Yeah. Complex life. Um, you know, most ecosystems on earth are, are sunlight based. So they're very correct in that, you know, a, a lot of life on earth would not exist. We'd have, you know, archaea, um, and maybe some, um, you know, animals and things that can survive in the dark that can eat those bacteria, but a lot of life on earth would not exist if we didn't have any sunlight, right? So we, we, we appreciate that sunlight, you know. For... But could they also be a base for, uh, for a photosynthetic life, life form? I mean, could they? What's that? For? A chemotrophic. So a chemotrophic could be you know, be the bottom of the food web and it move up. Right, up. right, right. Chemotrophs could, yeah, like, like we see in, you know, like the deep sea or methane seeps, right? Can they support other life? And, and yeah, like, uh, you know, again, giant tube worms, yeti crabs. So yeti crabs are these things that live near methane seeps and they wave their arms around to culture uh, meth methanogens, you know, and then they, they eat all the methanogens and they wave their arms around again and culture them um you know so yeah there there's a lot of life that can survive off of uh you know chemotrophs as well and i i also learned that ice is not just water right yeah yeah on other planets right you can that, that's what i learned i was like i remember i got my uh i got my nasa internship in astrochemistry and uh and the first thing you know they were like okay so you know we're gonna do these uh you know, this is water ice. And I'm like, well, but yeah, ice is water. No, <laughs> we're going to do all these different mixtures and, you know, ice, ice is in a variety of forms on other planets. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah. But can it be cubed? I think Jasmine would like to know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, is there a future for long distance band, uh, space flight and chemotrophic food webs? Is there a future? So, so can we base can we base our life off of chemotrophic food webs, right? Can we base human life on chemotrophic food webs? Uh, that's a good, it's a good question, right? It's a good question. Um, it depends I, for long human space flight. So, so you would, you know, we, we can't just eat, we can't just eat, you know, bacteria, obviously. Um, you know, if, if we were to find something that would, be eating this bacteria that would then um, expand, but our, our probably our main goal for long term uh, would try to be cultivating some type of um, you know with artificial light, some type of, of plant or something that we could sustain off of um, to culture a whole to culture something that we could actually eat from chemotrophic bacteria uh, would would be a bit tough. But I, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that would be. A, necessarily a, a strategy that that you know uh, long-term missions would would probably go after but uh but it is an interesting thought so so maybe science in the future will come up with that but yeah and one more question in the chat or nuclear tropic are there radiotropic organisms uh yeah so so there are uh so there are extremophiles right that are that are highly resistant to is that what you're talking about kind of radio resistant organisms Right, that's an interesting question because one of the main problems with going into space will be radiation. Right, it's the you know temperatures, uh, but largely radiation. So, so we know of quite a few um, bacteria uh, and organisms that are uh, radio resistant and can survive high high levels of radiation, which is crazy um, because where did they learn to adapt to that radiation? You know, is it you know on Earth we don't see the types of radiation uh, levels that they are adapted to. So, so those are really interesting organisms. But, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure about, yeah, the food web question, you know, having sustainable food um, based off of these, these organisms, I'm um, not sure. Yeah. Right, well, but, I'm, gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the knockdown for that, ding, ding. Uh, good job, I love it. All right, um, thanks, thanks everybody. It's, it's always really great to have you. Um, if you can hang around, please hang around. Um, if not, if you could tap in and out. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Much love to you. No, I love you so much. All right. Cheers, Jean. All right, my friend. So uh, next we have up 
Uh, Dr. Molly Maddie. Dr. Molly Maddie is a postdoctoral fellow at the Salk Institute. Um, I like to refer to her as Dr. DNA. And um, lately, I have been, oh, I'm going to go to the gallery view. Um, I've been talking about Dr. Molly Malley because she does so much. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I hope you guys looked at her video. Um, her video had a little bit of the work that she's doing, but a lot of bit of support of uh, young people coming up and going through college and actually becoming scientists. She's a real advocate of uh, really bridging the gap for people to go into STEM fields, STEAM fields. Um, and, and she's all about equity uh, and a great friend of mine. So I've been calling her uh, the worm whisperer. What's up? How you doing, Molly? Hey, I'm doing well. I've been lurking here without my last name, asking tough questions and, yeah, you know, hanging okay. out here. Thank you for putting that in the chat, by the way. I can only type. For some reason, I'm not able to paste. So that's been my, my chat challenge, just to let you guys know. I was going to put all their YouTube uh, in there and all their links in there. And I'm like, I'm, uh, yeah, you know, technical technical difficulty. <laughs> totally get it. Um, you're, you're a superhero. But you guys, you guys are so interesting. So I actually learned a whole lot on your chat. Um, obviously I love your science and I definitely want to get into that. And there's actually, um, some questions here for you that we will definitely get to, I promise. But, uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about is your journey as a scientist, uh, how you became a scientist and got to where you're at, because I know that you, uh, help a lot of other people go through that bridge. So tell us. So if I wanted to become a scientist, what, you know, what, what should I do? Well, I mean, thinking about wanting to become a scientist is definitely the first step. Um, I think that, you know, there's so many different ways to be a scientist and it depends like what you want to do with the science that you're doing. So you could do science and be an engineer like Jasmine talked about. You could do science and be a cyber warfare specialist. You could do science and be a biologist like me. You could also do science and have any other job and just like on the side, look at some caterpillars and write down your notes and take some pictures. And, you know, um, uh, Ben Frabel talked about, you know, these like online videos of like live streaming fish at the bottom of the ocean. And you could do community science where you just look out your window and say, okay, I saw this bird on this day. You write it down, you send it in and you're contributing to science. Um, so you don't have to go to school for forever to become a scientist. If you do want to go to school for forever to become a scientist, um, one of the things that I highly encourage you to do is to just tell people what your goals are. Anytime you're with somebody like Jean or me or any of the wonderful people who have presented today, tell us what it is you want to do and any obstacles that you think you might face as you start on that journey. So one of the obstacles that I faced was being from a really rural area. My family lives in a swamp in Northwest Florida, and it's a, at least two hours away from the closest university, mall, airport. Um, and so I was really uh, isolated from academic pursuits. I just went out and rolled around in a swamp and collected bugs. Um, but that was enough to get me really excited. And, you know, telling people I really like science and I want to be a scientist, they showed me opportunities to get out of my resource limited area and go to college for free, um, which I wouldn't have been able to do without, without scholarships. So um, nobody would have told me that if I wasn't honest about what my goals were. So, so that's my, my tip is to tell people what you want to do. Um, and then, you know, your stakeholders will help you find a way there. So basically where you started is exactly where I am and love to be, <laughs> you know, because I go and collect bugs and uh, try to get everybody really, really curious as they can. Um, and so also, I just want to remind you, if, if I don't remember at the end, everybody, we are recording this because we're going to be able to see this post live. We want to give a shout out to steamfestival2021.com. And you guys can see us all year at steamfestival2021.com slash scienting chats. We're at the beach on there, which I think is kind of cool and kind of neat. So Molly, uh, so we had uh, Aubrey Weir 
Uh, did you? Oh, um, so I also passed this to Jasmine as well, because she's obviously also, along with you, a huge advocate to build bridges and, and get people in there. So both of you are kind of in that in that space. Um, did your high school counselors help you apply uh, it? Oh, this is a three part question uh, from Aubrey. Is there um, an intern program that I can volunteer for that can also help guide me fill in oh, hashtag feeling a little lost? Yeah, um, I don't know what uh, age group this person is in, high but school. high school. Okay, yeah. So um, one of the things that any high schooler should do that's interested in science and feeling a little lost is to talk to your high school science teacher. Um, they likely went to college and studied science. And so even if you don't want to be a science teacher, you want to go and do science every day in a lab or um, in a uh, telescope making factory, um, then then you can talk to them and they probably have connections to people who are doing those things, people they went to college with. Um, so I would highly suggest talking to them. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I know this is being recorded. Um, when I was in high school, I got very little guidance from my teachers and from my uh, guidance counselor. And this was because I actually did really well in school and not to like humble brag or whatever, but often, you know, a lot of students who are, you know, more excelling on grade levels and standardized tests are also not given the support that they need because they just assume, you know, the people in charge just assume we know what we're doing. But here's a fun, fun, fun truth. None of us know what we're doing. All of us are feeling a little lost. And so as long as we just share with each other that we're feeling lost and we can literally piece together our futures, one puzzle piece at a time. Um, so I don't know where the students coming from if they're in San Diego, but um, the Salk Institute and the J. Craig Venture Institute both have summer intern programs where you can get paid to come into labs and do work. Now those applications are pretty much filled for now, um, but coming next year, you usually wanna start looking for these applications in around February. I know it seems super early to start looking for your summer um, gig in February, but that's when applications are usually opening and being due. Um, so these programs uh, aren't always paid, but uh, I highly suggest prioritizing the ones that are because you're gonna be doing work and you deserve to be um, paid for, for your time. Um, so again, uh, I can post those in the chat later. Um, yeah, so one's called the Heidoff Brody Summer Scholars Program at the Salk Institute here. And uh, one is an intern program through Drake Head, J. Craig Venture Institute. There's a few more through um, other big uh, places in San Diego. But if you're not in San Diego, I would suggest just talking to um, your high school science teachers first for, for information. That's, that's amazing advice. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And all of the work that you do with all the kids. I wanted to ask a question because there is actually a question about some of the science that you're doing. I know you have a whole team of scientists that work with you that do part of this. And um, I work with you doing DNA. So I know that you're on that gig too. Um, and this, <laughs> so this is from a five-year-old Isaac Maldano, uh, Maldonado. Um, have worms ever escaped in your home since you're doing science at home? That's a question well, to get to, by the way. That's so great. Um, yeah, so um, I uh, live with my husband, Rob, um, who, who is on this call. I'm a great supporter of all of this stuff that we're doing. Um, he has a rule that the worms have to be dead to bring to my house. So all the worm stuff that I do in my home is with um, experiments that have already been completed. And I just take the um, no longer living worms and uh, usually count them, you know? And, and so my friends here, even if you don't have a college degree, high school degree, even if you haven't gone to middle school yet, you could probably help me with my research because most of it is just involves counting. So if you can count to 100, you can do my day-to-day -day work. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yep. Yep. I mean, I was blown away to know that you use color to be able to see different things in the worms because we made a rainbow cake the other day. Together. We did. We did make a rainbow cake. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's kind of I, I always joke that my work could be done by it by a five year old like um, some of our listeners, um, because all you really need to know are some numbers and some colors and you count the blue things, you count the green things, you count the red things and that that's your data. Isaac, you could 100% do this. That's what's going on. But 
the journey to get here. I really encourage you guys. I'm really sorry I can't like paste anything. So I'm having mm. everything. But uh, I encourage you guys to go look at her YouTube on the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers YouTube channel. Um, we have YouTubes of all the scientists that are speaking today. They're going to be there for as long as they can be there so that you guys can look at them. They're pretty short. They're about 11 minutes to 25 minutes. So you guys get a little bit of background. If you guys have questions that you weren't able to ask, you are more than welcome to find me at Gene Wong, LXS at Gmail. Dot com and ask me and I have direct connect right to them to get your uh, question answered. But also please visit steamfestival2021.com slash science and chats and we'll be there all year. So you guys can totally um, see all of that. Molly, always incredible and amazing and thank you. Um, and uh, Tuesday, just to let you know, I didn't throw this out to Angela. Is Angela still on here? I'm like, where is she at? Oh, yeah, you are. All right. I didn't throw this out to her, but you know Tuesday, what Tuesday is. I do. So may the, may the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you, my friend. May the fourth be with you. Thank <laughs> you so much. I really, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you for all the links in there. Oh, Angela said, ha. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> What's the equivalent in Star Trek for May the Fourth be with you? Does Star Trek throw th throw it up, Angela, if you have it's it? Live long and prosper, yo! Oh my gosh! Come Angela, on, Angela. Molly was there for you. <laughs> I I straddle both both lore, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, like I'm here for Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. If you're a fantasy or sci-fi, I am here for you. That is what. <laughs> I super appreciate that. Thanks, y'all. Okay, guys. So up next, uh, if you are about climate change, if you are about the environment, uh, this is the person. Her name is Dr. Alyssa Griffith, and Griffin, and she is going to talk to you guys. She had a great YouTube video about it. Uh, hey, Alyssa, how are you? You got to unmute a little bit. Oh, good. How are you? <laughs> What's going on? It's so good. It's so, so good to see you. Um, we already have a couple of que uh, a question that was put in for you, so I'll, I'll ask that in a little bit, but cool. um, I've had a little bit of trouble po uh, pasting in my chat, but other people can paste in the chat for some reason. So it's whatever. I'm, you know, we'll, we'll roll. I've been typing. So um, yeah, so we're going to, you guys can go see her YouTube. It was really great. What I really loved about, and by the way, I got that red, what's it called? The red uh y'all read yeah so i went and got that so we're doing the experiment here um at my little school too so oh uh, perfect video is an experiment that you guys can do um to show you about climate science and climate change and ocean acidification um so if you want to talk to us a little bit about what you do Sure, definitely. So um, I actually didn't start off as a scientist. Um, I went all through school studying music and the arts and all kinds of things different from science. And then I got to college and I took a geology class. So I can't see you all. So I don't know if you're nodding, but I'll just, you know, do folks know what geology is? It's the study of rock, study of the earth, um, some geologists study other planets. Um, so yeah, I took a geology class and I just got so excited about it and I decided to become a geologist. So now I'm a geologist, um, but I study rocks that are in the ocean. So the ocean, when we think of it, we think of water, but it actually has rocks all within it, surrounding it, interacting with it all the time. And actually a lot of the animals that live in the ocean make their hard parts and their skeletons out of different minerals, which are sort of like rocks, right? So you do the same thing when you grow your bones. So your bones are actually made up of a mineral called apatite. And animals in the ocean do the same thing. They make their uh, hard parts, their bones, their skeletons, their shells out of a, a different mineral called carbonate, calcium carbonate. and Calcium carbonate is actually something that you have probably touched and seen and done things with your whole life. If you've ever played with chalk, I, I, I can't see anyone, so I don't know, but I bet a lot of you out there have played with chalk. We are all with you, yes. 
cool. Yeah. So chalk is actually calcium carbonate. So you know exactly what it is. I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you grind up some chalk and you put it into a soda, you're going to see it start to dissolve. You're going to see that chalk start to bubble and fizz and go away. So now you can imagine that if I were a little animal and my shell was made of the same thing as chalk and I went into a soda, I probably wouldn't be very happy, right? My shell, my skeleton, everything would start dissolving and that would be, that would be bad, right? We wouldn't want our bones to dissolve, right? And a lot of animals, their shells are kind of like their house. So it's like their house is just dissolving away. Um, yeah, and so the ocean, while it's not anywhere near as acidic as uh, a soda, what's happening is that all those bubbles in your soda are actually made up of carbon dioxide. And that's what actually makes your soda so acidic. You know how your parents are saying like, hey, don't drink too much soda, it's gonna eat away all your teeth. Well, that's that acid kind of eating away at your, at your teeth. Um, and the carbon dioxide is what makes the soda so acidic. And human beings were actually dumping a ton of carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere when we drive our cars, when we power um, any of our buildings or our homes, all of that takes up fossil fuels. And when we burn those fossil fuels, that carbon dioxide, it's just going up, up into the atmosphere. And some of that carbon dioxide stays there and it actually creates kind of a blanket around the earth and it's making our earth warmer and warmer and warmer, which might not seem like a big deal. What's a couple of uh, degrees warmer on the planet? But it turns out that the earth is at the perfect temperature for us to survive as a species, for humans to survive, for other organisms to survive. So even those couple degree difference actually is wreaking a lot of havoc already on the planet for us. And we'll continue to do so if we don't uh, lower those carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. And then what's interesting is actually about a third of that carbon dioxide that we send up into the atmosphere actually gets sucked up by the ocean every single year. And so now, remember I told you the carbon dioxide going into your soda is what makes it acidic, right? It's the same thing with the ocean. As the ocean sort of sucks up that CO2, that carbon dioxide, the ocean is now becoming a little bit acidic. So all of those animals that have those chalk shells and chalk skeletons, they're now sitting in a giant ocean that's becoming more acidic and starting to eat away at their shells or making it more difficult for them to grow those hard parts out of calcium carbonate. So that's what I study. I look at those changes in ocean chemistry and how it impacts different organisms. And the other thing I look at is uh, plants that live underwater, so aquatic vegetation that lives underwater. And when plants photosynthesize, do you guys know about photosynthesis? Okay, cool. So when plants photosynthesize, which is what they do to make energy and grow, they turn sunlight into energy. Um, when they do that, they require carbon dioxide. So they take carbon dioxide out of the air. And so we think about this a lot with trees on uh, land, but plants under the ocean are doing the same thing. So I'm studying now how seagrasses, which are a type of aquatic vegetation that you find near the coast. Sorry, you can hear my, my little baby screaming in the background, maybe. <laughs> Come in here if you want. <laughs> yeah, she'll, she'll probably make an appearance here momentarily. <laughs> she, should. she should, we're all about that. I love babies. I was saying, okay, this is just a little little side thing, right? Liza? So I always say say with my wife, there's always like the march for the babies. I'm like, who's not with the babies? Who's <laughs> not being with the babies? <laughs> no, totally. Yeah, totally. So yeah, anyways, so I uh so yeah, I also study those plants and how they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and actually store them inside their bodies. And that might be a way that we as humans can actually help lower the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and sort of help keep our, the temperature of our um, planet more stable and at that perfect temperature that lets us uh, stay here and grow all the food we eat and uh, live our lives as humans, right? <laughs>
That is so amazing. Your talk is incredible. If you if you wanted to go get her and I could talk for a minute and then I'll because I have a couple questions that kids ask you. No and, worries, grandma's on it. So oh, find her away. <laughs> Hello to the abuela. Okay, good. All right. So I want to get into a couple questions that uh, some kids put in for you. Lay a bit. Okay, so I love this question because this kid is a think what I call it here. Uh, at, at our group, we call hashtag, you're a thanker. You're a thanker right here. <laughs> Ray ben, she I said, love it. Uh, so she watched your YouTube video and she is really, really worried about the coral, even though you said, don't worry, she's incredibly worried. And so she has an idea and wondering if people are working on a sunscreen to put on the coral. Is there, is that a, a yes? And yes, we need to do the other things that you said, but is that, um, is somebody working on that? Wow, that is a great question. Um, so what people, so it might not be exactly a sunscreen like you're thinking about, but what folks are looking into, what a lot of coral scientists are looking into is that there are some corals that for some reason aren't impacted by these different things we're talking about. They're not impacted by, you know, the warmer ocean temperatures and they're not impacted as much by ocean acidification. And so what some scientists are doing is they're trying to figure out why. They're trying to figure out why those corals tend to be uh, more resilient uh, against those different, what we call stressors, right? Anytime you're stressed, you're like, oh, right? The corals are the same way. And so what they do is they actually look at the corals and they look at their genetics to see if there are certain genes, and this is out of my uh, expertise, so if there are any other scientists on the call that have uh, you know, things to add, please do. But they look at their genetics to try to identify what characteristics of those corals um, cause them to be more resilient. And then what they can actually do is they can take that information and they can grow what they call super corals. They can kind of take those pieces of the genetics of the, of the corals that are more resilient and put them into other corals and kind of give them like superpowers, right? So they can like, it's like a super serum. They can extract the superpower out of one coral and give it to the other corals so that maybe in the future, all corals will have that special ability to be more resilient to ocean acidification or uh, ocean warming. And so it's not exactly a sunscreen, but they are trying to see if maybe some corals have like a superpower that acts like a sunscreen that they can then give to other corals. So while you're talking, I'm totally thinking about this because uh, honestly, and I know I, I know you too, Alyssa, like my mind is blown by this question. Like that's just like next level thinking, right? Like, yeah. Um, so I was thinking, you know, the experiment that you did in your YouTube with the Tums and um and you know the 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 soda and the water what if we put sunscreen around the tums and then looked i mean we need to take we need to take your experiments take it to the next level right and yeah like, so like, that's but that but but the, so the only issue that i would see right is that the coral is living so it right because they're right right yeah, so there's a lot of factors that play into that. Um, you know, a, a question that I get often, which is such a good question, and I think related to yours is, well, if we put the Tums in there and it kind of neutralizes that acid, you know, because that's what Tums are. If, right. if anyone on the call is familiar with what a Tum is, it's a type of medicine that you take because your stomach is super acidic. It's like way more acidic than a soda and that's what digests all your food. So when you take a Tum, what it does is it actually neutralizes some of that really strong acid in your stomach and kind of settles your stomach a little bit. So I, I've been asked before, oh, well, why don't we just dump a bunch of Tums into the ocean, right? <laughs> and neutralize some of that acid. And that's a great idea. And actually there are scientists out there who tried this idea in small in small like uh, patches of the ocean to see how uh, you know it might help uh, you know those ecosystems. Unfortunately, the problem we keep running into is a problem of what we call scale, so size because when we think about the ocean and how big it is, it covers 
uh, 70% of our planet. And so that's a lot of water, right? That's a really big cup. And we would need a really big tum to put in there, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's a great idea, maybe on a smaller scale, like on a reef scale or on, on like a, a local scale, but to try and reverse the whole ocean via that method, it's, it's just not feasible because the ocean is just too big. <laughs> But I think I'm so I'm, I think I'm gonna play with the idea just a little bit because I, I I think it's good. But we also have to do some basic things. But before we get to that part, which you know I want you to uh, give us the, how we can you know make this better and things that we can do. Uh, there was another question um, that also watched your YouTube video. You 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 got some views, Alyssa. Uh, oh great. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and, and it was great, it was so engaging uh, for the kids. And then experiment, you guys, if you haven't seen it, you guys gotta go see it. Um, how long can you stay under the water without a tank? Me personally or a human being? <laughs> you, you, because they watch yours <laughs> under there. And did you have it? I thought you had a tank on though. I mean, I guess, uh, oh, I definitely had a tank on. Um, I mean, I guess forever. I guess the real question is how long can I stay breathing under the water without a tank, right? <laughs> Scientists will always do that, right? right? <laughs> Words, right. Um, I, uh, gosh, I don't know. I've never really timed myself uh, without a tank. I have a lot of friends who are much better at it than I am. They're called free divers. Yeah. And free diving is when you, uh, you know, you go diving in the ocean without a tank and you're underwater for, you can be underwater for about, uh, I don't, some folks I know can do between like five, five to 10 minutes, which blows my mind because I, I definitely can't do that. I have had to swim across um to get my scientific scuba certification i had to swim across uh an olympic sized pool underwater without coming up for air and it sounds easier than it actually is so next time you're in a big swimming pool try to swim across without coming up for air and whew, it took me a couple tries <laughs> i mean i want to learn how to scuba i haven't even scuba but i i i saw yours too but so so with that question though, you don't need a tank if like the, the, the straw, right? Like you, you Yeah, you can snorkel. Because, because um, a lot of coral and the things that you study, it's not deep down. It's not like you're going yeah. like where Ben Frable's going and you know, like, like, or Andy Allen, who's gonna be coming up, like you don't have to go that deep, right? No, definitely not. So we do a lot of our work on snorkel. Um, Sometimes what happens though is because we're at the coast, we get tides. And so we can go out there and be like, oh, it's so shallow. We can use our snorkels. And then we come back to check on it in a couple hours and we're like, oh no, <laughs> we need our scuba now. So um, that does happen sometimes. But yeah, snorkel, you can access a lot of this, uh, a lot of these environments just with a snorkel, which is really cool. Really, really cool. So um, I'd like you to, wait, is it true that the bright colors in the sunset are caused by chemicals in the air? Yeah, so that has to do with, um, yeah, different gases and different densities of gases in the air and water vapor and all kinds of different things that make up our atmosphere. And then also it has to do with um, something called refraction. So the way that light uh, bends basically and the curve of the earth. So, um, the sun as it's setting, you know, there's this curvature to the earth, right? Don't let anyone tell you the earth is flat. Um, come talk to me, send me an email if someone tries to convince you the earth is flat. <laughs> and so there's this nice curve to the earth, right? It's a ball. And um, as the light is traveling through the air, all of those different gases, they have different densities, which means some are heavier than others. But then there's all these little particulate things too, like dust and, and water vapor. And the light, when it hits and goes through uh, those different gases or it hits different particles, then yeah, it refracts and it'll cause uh, different colors. Yeah, great question. I'm probably not the most qualified to answer it, but uh, hopefully I did okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Alyssa, you're, doing, you're, you're amazing. Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually learned so much. So I really like um, how you define the three R's, the reduce, reuse, and recycle. And 
yes, recycle, but what? Like, don't do that. Like, don't even get <laughs> stuff, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I always like to say they're in order of how well they work, right? So step one is to reduce because if we don't use it to begin with, then we don't have to worry about what to do with it when we're done using it, right? So if you reduce the things that you're using, then that's step one. If you have to use something, then try to reuse it, right? Try to use it for another purpose so um, that you're not just using it and throwing it away. So that's really effective too. And then recycling is great. I don't want to discourage anyone from recycling, but recycling actually takes a lot of energy and a lot of water. And so it's kind of like our last, uh, our last uh, resource for trying to, you know, um, reuse materials and goods in our, in our uh, societies. Amazing. So I want to make sure that you know, I love that, Leah, thank you again for your question about the sunscreen. Uh, we don't want you to worry too much. So um, talk to us really quick before we let you go, Lisa, Dr. Lissa. Uh, so the coral reef going to be okay? I think they're, you know, they're, I'm not going to lie to you. They're facing some trouble. They're facing some trouble. And so I think we all have to just work together, right? Not just in the United States, but all over the world, we need to work together to uh, support the coral reefs and to help save them and to protect them. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can do that. But as Jean was saying, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, that's huge because that'll uh, prevent more carbon dioxide from going into the atmosphere, which is really one of the biggest threats to our coral reefs. But if we look at the geologic record, which is millions, hundreds of millions of years, um, the corals uh, have been there. The corals have survived a lot of crazy stuff. So for example, you know, I'm sure you've heard about the dinosaurs getting taken out by an asteroid, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. um, the corals survived that. They survived it. We don't know how well they were doing for a while, but they survived it. So. I think in terms of just survival, they'll be okay. But in terms of their ability to support other life forms and to support humans and to maintain their beauty and all of these things that we enjoy about them, we're gonna have to work pretty hard uh, to, to protect them. So, yeah. Very, very cool. Dr. Alyssa, always so great to see you. Um, I can't uh, wait to meet the baby. The <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much um, for being here. Uh, you guys go check out our YouTube on the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers YouTube channel. Please stop in to the STEAM Festival, uh, 2021.com slash Science and Chats. We'll, it, it'll be up all year long. You guys can see our YouTube videos. We're gonna post this as well. So you guys will see some of your questions being answered. So I hope that you did it. Dr. Alyssa, I love you so much. Um, thank you so much for being here. Hello to the to the baby and your husband and, er and everyone and, you, and, and your mother. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, right now I wanna remind everybody that we're recording this. And um, so it's gonna be posted so that you guys can see all of this all year <laughs> in access. Um, there we go. Um, it's open access for you guys to see. Why uh, do you have blue hairs? Anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on real quick. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm actually really interested in your own. <laughs> okay. All right. So now we have uh, Dr. Nicholas Galitsky. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Galitsky uh, is from a uh, cosmologist from the UC uh, Cosmology Postdoctoral Scholar at, and does on the Sims Observatory. He's building a telescope. He's built, and I got to go see it. You guys, I 100% got to go see it um and uh it was amazing it was as big as a helicopter which was incredible um hold on real quick he have blue hair his hairs are red but he's short. so i guess it's gonna be yeah okay let's see sorry nicholas <clears throat> Done. 
All right. So this is Dr. Nicholas Galitsky. He's building a telescope that can see 14 billion light years away. And I had the privilege of actually going and seeing it. And it was absolutely a bucket list kind of day. It was amazing. Thank you so much for being here. How are you today, Nicholas? I'm uh, doing great. Decided to uh, swing by the lab so that we can get the, uh, the uh, at least virtual tour as well if uh, people are interested. Oh, nice. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, let's go. Yes, let's go. Uh, let's go check. So I was in uh, Mike Watson's. Not to flex, Mike. I love you so much. But remember, we were talking about this is Nicholas's garage. Oh, so uh, yeah. Much bigger. Check this out. There we go. So we're in a we're in a weird place because we're in a seventy foot. We call it the high bay. So we're in a seventy foot tall room, but our telescope is big, but it's not that big. We just use the bottom ten feet of it, which is just more of a uh, what space was available when we started building this thing, uh, and university, you know what they have available. But yeah, there it is. Wow, that's our telescope doing all sorts of fun stuff. Oh, people will love this too because. You know, while what we're we're trying to build probably the most uh, sensitive CMB telescope in the world. You know, we're this is pushing all of the technology, all of the knowledge we have to try and build something that's uh, as sensitive as this telescope will be uh, once we get it in the sky to you know hopefully be the best millimeter wave telescope in the world. Um, but in the testing phase, we kind of get by with what we can, and also just you know science is always on a shoestring budget, so. Um, we make do with uh, what we can and we try and make it a budget. So my graduate students put together this guy this last week, which is, <laughs> if anyone can see it, it's just like a normal cooler with electronics flying out of it because we're trying to uh, isolate something thermally and, and cool it and heat it to control the temperature. And well, you know, a cooler like this is super cheap and it is to insulate, so why not? So this is, a, this is your standard cooler with a bunch of wires coming out of it and our really sensitive custom electronics hanging out inside being uh, alternatively cooled and heated. <laughs> wow, uh, duct tape and a cooler to do these. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And I've got a whole drawer full of duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, me too, you know. I mean, I love duct tape all the time, every single day. Um, so we did have a couple questions, but I, I wanna uh, look all over your thing, uh, all, all over your telescope. So can you show us, I've been like pointing on my screen as if you could see where my finger is on my screen, Nick. <laughs> Tech, no, <laughs> yes. So the uh, thing that, the little bar up there that grabs magnetic field waves. Yeah, and that's actually got the sensor installed because we're checking some of the magnetic fields this weekend. So you can see that. Uh, it's hard to see, but uh, there, there. That's a, a magnetometer. It's, it's, uh, it's sensitive to magnetic fields. And so this is kind of a wild thing about this particular telescope is, I, I don't know if anyone on here has seen um, those, uh, I don't know how you call it, those uh, magnetically levitated like little racetracks with a superconductor you dip in liquid nitrogen. So this is a fun physics demo you can look up online, um, but you can put this superconductor uh, material in a magnetic field and it will levitate there. You know, you can like pass your hand underneath it and there's like, there's nothing there. It's just being held up by uh, superconducting properties in a magnetic field. And then it can zip around a little racetrack. And we actually have one of those inside of our telescope where we have one of our optical devices uh, is, uh, has a magnetic superconducting bearing. And basically it's levitating inside there right now. It's, there's a, I think it's 10 kilos or something like that, 30, 40 pounds worth of equipment that is levitating inside this vacuum on a magnetic field and a superconducting ring. And it spins it around at about two Hertz. So that's, that's in this section right here. This whole section is our, uh, what we call the half wave plate, but it's a spinning optical device that we do. And this guy right here, we call that a gripper motor. Um, because superconductors only work at a super certain temperature. So when we get warm enough, it will fall unless we grab it. And those, these guys are so we can grab onto it so it doesn't fall on the piece below it. Um, but this is just kind of like some of the fun things about this telescope that make it uh, really interesting, but really hard to work with. And that's part of why we have the magnetometer is because we're spinning a giant magnet around in there 
and our detectors are also sensitive to magnetic fields. So we want to understand uh, what kind of uh, magnetic fields it's generating as it spins around. Anyway, just as a like a weird little part of this whole telescope, there's a lot of bits and pieces <laughs> that are a little oh, unusual. There are tons of pieces and talking uh, when you're talking about the ice chest, I was reminded that it's uh, what you have there behind you. I don't know if you in your video, I used your picture of what it looks like inside there. So you guys go to his YouTube video and you guys can see what the inside of that looks like a little bit. But how do you get it so cold? Because it's uh, uh, so Kelvin versus Celsius. It's, it's colder than negative 400 degrees, correct? I think it's, oh God, uh, well, absolute zero is negative 273 Celsius, but most of us hang out the Fahrenheit scale and the Fahrenheit is negative 460 or so. Yeah, okay, so yeah. Fahrenheit. That's cold! Very That's very cold. cold. Very We're as cold, cold as you can get cold, yeah. How do you get it that cold? How do we get it that cold? That's all the noise, I don't know how, am I, I hope you guys can hear me well. Our, no, our lab is quite noisy, which is why I keep moving away. Um, so we get in that cold with uh, a branch of physics, frankly, that's called cryogenics. Uh, so cryogenics would be the art of getting things very cold and keeping them there. Um, the world does not like things to be that cold. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I guess you go with entropy on this one, but there's a lot of things that they're trying to keep, bring it back up to room temperature. So um, it's a whole branch of study and, and one I've spent a lot of time in to, to understand how best to do it. But um, there are, the way we do it is we use commercial hardware that they just sell us uh, and a whole lot of engineering that goes into it. Uh, the first thing we do is uh, you remove all the air from inside there. So our telescope is in a, you know, in a vacuum. Um, and so there's no air in there. And so that's one way to you know, insulate different objects. And then you use special materials and other hardware and uh, reflective blankets around the inside shells to basically uh, block any light or anything else from heating up the inside. So there's a lot of just insulation effectively. Um, and so you insulate uh, your coldest stages. And then the, um, the commercial hardware is fantastic. So you can buy, you know, it's expensive, but you, you buy a uh, piece of hardware that will cool. The, the main one, the pulsing, if you can hear that, the pew 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 is uh, a commercial pulse tube. A pulse tube is just using a physics trick to use pressure gradients to remove um, heat. And so that's kind of, you know, fun and fairly straightforward, but they've gotten really good at it. So they're very efficient. Uh, and then the other, the main piece we use, the really fun piece of hardware, uh, which I'll go take a look at, is called the dilution refrigerator, which uses, it's actually a quantum mechanical trick um, using two isotopes of helium. So helium-3 and helium-4, and it uses a mix of those. Uh, to achieve temperatures down to seven millikelvin. So that's, you know, 0.007 degrees above absolute zero, which is wild. And that's this piece of hardware. This is, uh, I guess I can do some advertising. This is from Blue Force in Finland. So there's a company in Finland that specializes in these. There's only a handful of them around the world that can actually build these. Um, but they're amazing pieces of hardware where they'll just, you know, you flip a switch once you're cold enough and it will just automatically cool it down to... Uh, we, we use our system at about 100 millikelvin, although I think this will bottom out at about 30. And obviously a lot of like plumbing and stuff coming out of this. This is our, our little cable wrap here. It makes, makes all this hardware work, not to mention quite a bit of power to actually run it all. Not something we can exactly plug in at, uh, at home. <laughs> all, of, all of that is really, really cool. Amazing, and I really love my time there. I want to get to a couple questions that people had for you. Um, so, uh, uh, Kyle Lee, where, okay, where and what elevation if, uh, do you need your telescope to be to see uh, the furthest? That's a great question, actually. So we we, we work in microwaves, uh, and microwaves are kind of right between the very far infrared and radio waves, almost radio in some senses. Um, and that just happens to be where the light from the Big Bang has the most signal. So that's why we uh, observe in the microwave. That's uh, where the signal's brightest. Um, but it's a bit of a problem because, um, you know, if you, you, this was one of the experiments we did with Gene, but if you look at a microwave and what a microwave does, uh, like in a microwave oven, uh, it heats food using effectively water vapor or water. Um, and that's just to say that water is really good at absorbing microwaves. 
Uh, and that's a problem if you wanna look at them because our atmosphere has quite a bit of water in it. And so we have to go to the highest and driest altitude or locations on earth um, to get the best observing. And so usually high altitude just means you get above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere and dry deserts, that sort of thing, just tend to have less uh, water vapor in the atmosphere to begin with. Uh, so this guy and myself will be headed to Chile probably in about a year uh, to go set it up to do observing. And we work out of the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile. And we're at the third highest observatory in the world uh, at just over 17,000 feet high. So we are up there on a mountain. Um, and I should say these days, there's two kind of centers of CMB observing. Uh, one is in Chile at 17,000 feet. The other is a little bit lower at the South Pole. There's actually a bunch of millimeter uh, experiments at the South Pole. I think that's only about 9,000 feet. Um, but a lot of people don't know this. The South Pole is actually one of the driest places on Earth. Uh, so it's actually a desert there as well. And just the uh, cooler temperatures remove a lot of the water vapors. So they get similar uh, uh, viewing uh, capabilities that we do in Chile. That's, that's a great question though. Yeah, I, I, I thought so too. All right, so we have another question uh, from Annie Wessel. When do you think your telescope will be done? How long before, and oh, and when it is done, how long before it should return data? Will that happen in my lifetime? I'm 10. <laughs> I hope it happens in your lifetime. I hope it happens in mine. Uh, this last year hasn't been great for schedules, um, but yeah, I feel like this is like, uh, yeah, is, is, is that person from the NSF, are they asking? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we get that question a lot, but usually from our funding organizations uh, who would like to know when we're going to get things done. Um, no, so we, I work a lot actually with the scheduling of this to make sure that we stay on schedule, on budget, and that sort of thing. And most experiments uh, are on the five to 10 year uh, time scale, is, is what I'd say. So we, we had originally planned it for it to take about five years to build it and get it on sky. That's been extended a bit largely due to this last year's disruptions. Um, and then normally our first observing run would be about five years. So if I'm looking at this one in particular, this telescope, we're trying to get it to Chile next year. We started this design in about 2016. So it's taken about five years to put it all together and get it up and running. Um, so we're gonna start getting what we say on sky just means that the telescope is looking at the thing and it intended to look at. And that's gonna start in 2022. The full Symes Observatory, which is actually three of these telescopes and one that's much larger, um, will, I think, fully get on sky around 2023, will be fully operational. And then we have about five years of observing. So, uh, and that's not to say we won't start releasing results before the end of it, but if you wanted to say like our full, you know, results would be probably around 2028, 2029 is when we'll be trying to get those out. Um, so that's kind of a typical time scale for, I'd say, a large ground-based observatory is about 10 years from, you know, first conceptual designs to getting, you know, your, your, some of your main results out, right? It's about 10 years. There are experiments, see if you're smaller or cheaper also, you can do it faster. I, I work on uh, some projects that are like five years end to end. Uh, that's very fast. It's hard to do, but <laughs> it can be done. And then at the other end of the spectrum is uh, satellites, say, say your JWSTs. And that's like, oh, that's going to be like 20 or sometimes longer, 20, 30 years uh, to get a big satellite up and, and going. And then there's some that are a little odd. Like if you look at dark matter detection these days, or um, LIGO is a fantastic example. So LIGO is the um, laser observatory that looked at, that's found gravitational waves recently. Um, but there were various iterations of that you know, it's effectively an observatory, it observes gravitational waves. Uh, there were iterations of that for 30, 40 years before it found anything. Um, so the people on that project that actually seceded, you know, the, the people who got the Nobel Prize for it had, you know, some of them had been working on that for 40 or 50 years before they, they got the results they were looking for, uh, which takes a certain amount of dedication. Um, but, you know, I think they would agree that it was worth it. And uh, so it, it all kind of, plays out. I guess I should say the thing we are looking for specifically, the, the signature we're looking for uh, from, from the early universe, the Big Bang, um, the, the very specific niche part of that that we are doing, people have been going after for 20 or 30 years already. So this is uh, on the tail of that. We haven't found it yet. So this is why we have to build more and more sensitive telescopes is to really you know, explore kind of 
uh, areas of uh, capabilities that we haven't been able to before. A great and, question, though. And for uh, I, I will just shout out for some of your funding uh, sources. You are being incredibly re uh, resourceful. He has an ice chest, duct tape, silver tape. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to the oh oh Smurf technology. So right. Smurf. Yeah. They talk about they talk about Smurfs a lot. You guys look at his uh, YouTube at the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers on our YouTube channel, uh, and you can find all of our scientists YouTubes at steamfestival2021.com slash sciencing chats all year long. Um, it's brilliant. I got to go, you guys see that scaffolding behind him? I actually got to go up there and see on the top because the actual show oh, the microscope, see right where his finger was. I'm all, I'm all how can we see this? The okay. actual, or the telescope that you could see is right there and it kind of looks like a telescope. Um, we have, we have one more question, and I, I've actually asked you this question myself before. Um, what telescope should I buy? Is there a better brand being a telescope guy? Um, I'm looking for an endorsement. I, we're endorsing Tom's. We're like, like we're about it today. <laughs> like, there we go. Yeah, what, what funding can I bring to my lab right now? <laughs> um, it's a shameless promotion. So let's see here. Um, I went, actually, I'm not the best person to ask. The best people to ask, and I will do a local endorsement here for, um, I think it's Oceanside, OPT, Oceanside Photo and Tel Telescopes. I might be messing up their acronym, but OPT. Uh, so I went and got a telescope from them for my own observing pleasure. I got a little five inch reflector. I got a Celestron, which is a pretty common hobbyist or, um, you know, there's some reasonably, very reasonably priced, under $100 even, uh, telescopes that they will sell. Uh, that will get you great observing of, say, you know, Saturn's rings or Jupiter and the moons and that sort of thing, or uh, nearby galaxies, that sort of thing. So there's really a lot you can do with a pretty small budget telescope. And uh, the guys up at OPT know way more about it than I do and then uh, are very knowledgeable of that sort of thing. Uh, so that's what I would say. Um, and it's, yeah, it's worth getting into. It is a fun hobby. It is also can be an expensive hobby, but doesn't have to be an expensive hobby. It really depends how far down that path you want to go. Right. No, totally. What was crazy is because I was talking uh, to Dr. Sonny about how you have to cool down your computer and like he totally understands that how all of that stuff runs really, really hot. But now you actually have the technology, which I got to see um, to be able to track, you know, the fluctuations in it. So, yeah, you guys see the ice chest. But what we did, what we didn't see is this really super incredible high technology that's all in there too. So, I mean, it's, what you're building is amazing. My, my mind is absolutely blown um, every single, every, every, every single time. And um, I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nick. Uh, look at him on Twitter for uh, Astro, Astro Nick right there. Yeah, yeah, Astro Dr. Nick, yeah. Astro Dr. Nick on uh, Twitter. Uh, follow him at the Sims Observatory for um, UC San Diego and his entire team, uh, like Molly and all the scientists here say, um, every single thing that all of them do takes an entire team of people um, to make it happen and all different kinds of things uh, for being there. Uh, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you wanted to say? No, thanks for having me and glad I could share it. Yeah, keep on learning. Thank you so much and stay curious. So up next, you guys, we are going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Andy Allen, uh, Andrew Allen. He is a professor at the J. Craig Venter Institute and Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, studying genomics, ocean phytoplankton. Um, I had the great honor um, to hang out with him. And uh, on the Scripps Pier, you guys, you know when you guys go down the beach and that gate is locked and that whole thing? So I got to go up there and it was, Incredible. Hi, Andy. Hey, Jean. You, you might see the name under him says Lisa, uh, but it's, you know, it's Andrew. That's what's going on. <laughs> um, it's so, it's so good to see you. I loved, um, I mean, I've known you for many, many years. It's been a while. And the day that we went out to the pier, um, I, I like, like you were like, yeah, I'm not really sure if I'm being clear. And my mind was absolutely blown that whole time. Like I was like the information that I got, I really hope you guys go and watch his YouTube. It's incredible to see um, 
So we just talked to Nicholas, who does more of the engineering side, right? But all of you guys always have to cross that. So you have to get better tools to do your job. So you're more really on the uh, biological side, but without the technical side, there's no way for you to do that, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so you guys started out with buckets, like pets, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, buckets are uh, still a very effective uh, uh, way to sample the ocean, right? I mean, if it didn't broke, uh, you know, don't don't fix it to an extent, right? I mean, uh, sometimes you just need to to grab some seawater, right? I mean, when I was a, a graduate student at the University of Georgia, we would, you know, go on these research cruises um, across the South Atlantic Bight, which is uh, a really interesting ecosystem really dominated by very very large estuaries and, and marshes and a tremendous uh, shrimp uh, fishery it's very very different than uh, Pacific Ocean uh, coastal upwelling ecosystems but uh, you know so I, I had two I had two PhD advisors and with one of them we 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 had like so, so many boxes of things that we would take out on, on, on these boats and um, pretty high footprint filtration rigs and gear and I had to get all this stuff ready and then my my other advisor would show up in the morning and he'd, he'd, he'd have a bucket and a net and and I was always so jealous of him because I was like well wow. and this guy was a really productive oceanographer addressing like super fundamental questions and um you know I, I just always thought that was so so neat that he could be you know travel so light and um and, and, and get what he needed to do to, to um, address, you know, really fundamental cutting edge state of the art questions. So sometimes, right, it's, it, it can be fine, but, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's true that um, the engineering side of, of things is, is I think really kind of where, where the future of biological oceanography is to, to an extent is, is engaging robotics to, um, to, to improve the, the way that uh, we, you know, we, the, the time scales and the spatial resolution that can be sampled to really pick apart the, the details of, of, of what's really happening. I mean, in some ways you think about, I mean, even much more sophisticated than a bucket, but, you know, a research cruise, you know, going, going along some predefined transect and stopping at some predefined stations and then deploying um, fairly sophisticated sampling equipment and you know triggering it at predefined depths i mean it's really pretty pretty barbaric right i mean imagine some aliens sampling earth and trying to figure out what was going on on the planet by just like dropping down a net and scraping it and bringing it up and seeing what what you know what they got right they might have a very skewed vision of <laughs> what happens on 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 earth exactly so so i yeah i think that in the era of, of genomics right and and really um uh, cr crossing into questions and interests about you know how subcellular processes are driving um, uh, you know global element cycles you know it's we, we have to um, up up our game in, in terms of uh, sampling in a, in a less barbaric and, and, and much more sophisticated detailed um, thoughtful thoughtful way and 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 you know the robotics community of course is just you know having a, a revolution just like the the biology community is, but it's, you know, this is, this is where the breakthroughs uh, happen is right when two disciplines start, start working together. And, and it's so hard to do. And that's why it happens because people are siloed and they speak their own languages. And it's very hard to find the time and the bandwidth to, to really, um, you know, interact across your discipline. But I, I think in the coming, you know, decade or so, there's going to be a, um, a lot of exciting um, directions that hopefully can be forged when when the robotics community and the and the and the, and the biology community um, re really kind of put put their heads together and think about how to, how to sample more intelligently to capture the processes that um, that that are that you know still need to be in, investigated in more more detail. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons that I I like our whole you know I really love our whole group of legal extraordinary scientists and engineers because. You know, we have from nanotechnology to, you know, with, with Tom and then, you know, uh, ro robotics and cyber defense with Sunny. And then, you know, we're going to go into space with, with yeah. Nick and into the ocean with Ben and you and, and genomics. And then Lisa's about the virus. Like we have like all of it, right? I always learn a lot. 
and uh, you guys all know each other. And um, after after we talk to you, we're going to bring back as many many of uh, the scientists that come together just to see if we can uh, blow each other's mind real quick. We're like just a funny little round table to see if we could do that. We did have a question that came in after uh, watching your YouTube video. Um, this wasn't on your YouTube video, but um, I think that they probably follow some of the stuff you do. I know that you study phytoplankton, diatoms, and look for uh, food webs. So the question uh, came from Carla Brittman. Um, she, should we worry about red tides or are they just part of a bigger food web? Um, that yes, we should absolutely worry about them. I mean, they're, they're a big problem. You're talking about, you know, bill, billions of dollars of damage to, you know, coastal economies, right? If the Dungeness crab fishery, you know, has to shut down from Puget Sound to, uh, Monterey Bay, that's, uh, that's, that's a, that's a, you know, gigantic impact to, to local economies um but you know i think right the the, que the the question probably has something to do with you know how much of this is driven by natural cycles and, and how much of it is you know driven by anthropogenic um uh um stressors that that we could actually do something to to mitigate right and so that, that's kind of the the you know the big question right is 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 how what's what's natural right what what you know what what would be happening with red tides if 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 human beings weren't on the planet and you know we don't really know the answer to that uh, but there is a lot of credible evidence to believe that the intensity and magnitude of 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 red tides has increased in in the past you know 30, 30 years, particularly the past past ten years, you know, is re relatively indisputable. Um, so, you know, the question is why, right? And and why matters a lot because if we really did understand physiological and cellular and oceanographic mechanisms that, you know, we were confident promoted, pr you know, promoted the occurrence of of, of red tides, then um you know po policy would have a different role right yeah. you, you you know you could really have the opportunity to say you know th this 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 type of 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 nutrient loading in this way this amount is, is causing this problem so that's why it's it's really important to understand mechanisms because that's 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 how you get to, to policy eventually and i mean you just can't understate the problem i mean we're talking about right the dungeness crab fishery and shellfish on the west coast right in, in florida and in massachusetts um there are other types of red tide organisms that are you know just just an extreme nuisance right and also just interfere with the um ability of, of people to to enjoy the 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 seashore right which is a, a really big deal right because it's important for 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 our mental health and be, being able to engage with with nature and i mean the ecosystem in, in some ways is is sick right and is and is letting us know um so we need to understand what's what's causing these and um th there are you know um some really good ideas and hypotheses some which have a lot of support um but it's important research i, I believe to to understand the, the details of what's what's driving these and uh why they're occurring and being able to predict them um with more certainty yeah, absolutely. So I love all of uh, the work that all the scientists are doing that you guys are doing because basically you guys just figure stuff out of why and how and that and then policy after that, which which kind of goes to that. But when you go out and you're looking for diatoms and phytoplankton, you're looking to support like food webs and the oxygen that we all breathe, right? So how yeah. many how much of the oxygen comes from phytoplankton diatoms in the ocean? Right. Um, well, so, you know, di so the, the ocean, right, is responsible for about half of photosynthesis on planet Earth, right? Um, and, um, you know, the oceans are three quarters of the planet, but only half of the photosynthesis, right? And that's because you know, photosynthesis actually only occurs in a small part of the ocean, the, the upper sunlit 
layer. Um, and, um, but oxygen, the oxygenation of the atmosphere results from um, when organisms produce oxygen and then they do not get respired to CO2 because when that happens, you consume oxygen, right? So, and, and, and land, right, most terrestrial photosynthesis, these organisms produce oxygen and then they get respired back to CO2, consuming oxygen in the process. And it's even so over geological time, you know, if you're gonna produce oxygen, what you need to do is produce it and then take the organic carbon and, and bury it before it can get respired back to CO2. Does that make sense? Right, yeah. and so that's why the ocean is so important for oxygen production because of this process called the biological pump where organic matter that's produced through photosynthesis escapes from the upper part of the ocean and is, and is buried. And you know, so when oil and natural gas companies are looking in the ocean for petroleum deposits, they're looking for things that, you know, like silicious ooze and other signatures of marine phytoplankton activity, because this is where a lot of the, the oil and gas deposits are. So anyway, the oceans are responsible for about half of oxygen on the planet and diatoms alone, maybe 20%, maybe 20, a fifth of global primary productivity can be attributed to diatoms. So that's, you know, every fifth breath you take, you might want to thank uh, Thalassia Syrah. Wait, I, I'm going to put that in there. Glassia Syrah. Wait. I said Thalassia Syrah, but yeah, so, there's other ones. So, so someone look it up and do a hashtag on that in our, in our chat. <laughs> put that in there. I put, I put diet hashtag biological pump and I put a uh, hashtag uh, microbial loop. Um, right. So uh, we also have another question for you that came in from Zachary Jasper. Um, <laughs> oh, this is funny. How fine does your net need to be? Oh, that's such a great question. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> The, the size of things, the size of different classes of microbes. It's like, you know, again, when I talked about, you know, sampling being fairly barbaric sometimes, right? I mean, the size of your, your, the device that you're filtering organisms with, you know, obviously massively influences what, what you see in the ocean. And with something like a net, it's a little bit hard because if you make the mesh too fine, um, you know, it'll, it'll tear or not filter very much water. Um, so, so these these types of plankton nets that, that you know that you um, might might um, deploy and lo lots of water goes through them. You know the smallest you could reasonably you know make one might might be ten microns, but you'd have to have that specially made. So the smallest ones that are sort of commercially available are twenty. Okay, and that's that's pretty small for for a plankton net, 20, twenty microns, but that's huge um, in terms of my uh, microbes, right? So most of the microbial biomass is definitely less than 20 microns. So even with a 20 micron net, you're only catching, like some people might call them the charismatic uh, me megafauna of phytoplankton, right? The, the really big, big phytoplankton, whereas the uh, multitudes of, um, you know, really uh, high abundance uh, microbes, you're gonna, you're gonna miss with a plankton net like that. So that's why you have to use filters that have much smaller pore sizes, like 0.2 microns would catch all the bacteria and, and all the microns, all, all the phytoplankton also. Do you so when we, so when we, when we go out on a, on a ship, if we want to use one filter to catch all of the microbes and then we'll purify RNA and DNA and proteins and everything from that filter, we would use a 0.2 micron filter because we think that catches the bacteria and everything larger. Viruses, of course, escape through that 0.2 micron filter and people who want to collect viruses and study them, need to use other, other, other approaches. That's, that's awesome. Do you have a, do you have a favorite diatom and why? Ooh, do I have a favorite diet? I have, I have lots of favorite diatoms all for different I was reasons. Like, Sarah Smith send this in. Cause. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd say my, my favorite diatom, you know, is, is probably uh, phaetoactylum, right? I have to I have to ride and die with phaetoactylum because, first of all, th this is a diatom that you can't really find it in, in, in the ocean very commonly. It was isolated from a tide pool in, in the UK in the early 20th century by, by a phycologist. I, I'm not sure who, but 
you know, fed oculum has just become a workhorse for genetics and cell biology um, and biochemistry of diatoms. So the, the reason that I, that I love and, and am frustrated with fed oculum is, is what we've been able to learn about diatom biology um, as a result of it, right? It's just, it's very relatively easy to, to work with. And over the years, we and other people have generated a, a whole bunch of sophisticated tools to, to really uh, uh, allow us to explore gene function and, and, and biochemistry in a lot of detail. So I think what fed diatom has given to, in terms of supplied knowledge about how diatoms work, I, I, think, I think you'd have to say it's, it's superior to any other diatom. And I, I'll tell you that that's in the, probably definitely not a popular opinion among diatom enthusiasts because you know, it's just not that important or that relevant um, ecologically. Um, and and uh, so that's interesting. But, you know, one that's really become one of my favorites as a result of uh, data that we've collected in the California Current is one called Catoceros because it's just so abundant. In fact, I think that it should be on the California state flag. I mean, it's, it's, it's such an important diatom for the California Current and for all of the biomass of biota in our in our local oceans and i think that it will be may, maybe an excellent model diatom for the decades to come i'm all peace out brown bear <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, uh per professor uh andrew allen again you guys can go to uh steam that's s-t-a-m uh festival 2021.com slash science and chats we're gonna have all of these scientists YouTubes up all year long. You guys can go to Leave Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers YouTube channel, see all of their talks. They're only about 11 minutes to 25 minutes. Teachers have your uh, students go and see them. If you guys wanna ask them questions, you can email me at genewonglxs uh, at gmail.com um, and please visit there. Uh, for now, uh, thank you so much, Professor Andy. I love it. I can't wait uh, until they go see yours. I would like you to stick around for just a couple minutes. We're almost done. We're this has been three hours. Wow. We've done this for three. That's what's up. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, it's less, you know, on Tuesday, uh, Mike and I did eight hours, which is really 10 hours straight live yeah. feed. And we baked a rainbow cake with uh Dr. Molly and Rob. Did you see Rob and Nicholas came and Sunny came? I haven't seen Rob. it, but I would like to. I'm sure it was a ton of fun. We baked a uh, rainbow cake live uh, science cake uh, using like, and we did a rocket wow. and all kinds of ridiculousness. But um, so Sunny and Nicholas, and um, if you guys can, I'm gonna there and there. Um, we want to thank you guys for coming. Oh my gosh, is Angela is Angela on the feed? Because she's like texting me your fatal act here. here. You can't see it, can you? She's texting me the name of it. I'm gonna try to type it, type it in there. Um, yeah, I'm gonna un. There you go, buddy. Yeah. Just as long as it's not too loud. Nah. There we go. So um, I was saying to Andy earlier, it's so nice to um, hang out with you guys in all the spaces that we hang out with, trying to excite and get kids curious and um, have people interact with all the different disciplines. And me, uh, you know, being the, the smaller brain uh, and bus driving this, I get to know so much because all of you guys tied together. So um, I wish Tom was here too with the nanotechnology and Angela, uh, I know Lisa's around there uh, somewhere, um, Alyssa, um, but all of your guys' uh, science, when you put it all together, I'm like, man, there is great hope for the world right now with everything being so crazy. Um, with everything that you guys are doing, there's really, really great hope. So I was hoping, and um, I'll start with you, Dr. Sunny, your rainbow during this crazy time. And I'll, I'll tell you my rainbow at the end is something. So I know COVID's been crazy, right? Like it's been nuts. And I'm not going to lie. There's been some what? But what is something good that's happened? I, you all know Ben's. He's not here, but I'll speak for him too. So I'll start with you, Sunny. Well, I mean, normally like work schedules are, are already crazy even before the pandemic. Um, in some ways, I think some of my team and myself feel more productive, but also maybe more stressed. But out of that, um, I think I spent more time with my kids in the last year than maybe the last three or four years prior to that, just because 
you know, they're here, uh, I'm here. Uh, I feel fortunate to sort of be able to do that. I know that's, that's not every family can do that, but I feel really fortunate to have been able to spend so much time, you know, with my two sons uh, in the last year. It's been, it's been amazing. We've learned a lot about each other. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's so amazing. Um, so I'm gonna go to you next, Nick, but I'm gonna give you a second because I, I will tell you Ben's. Obviously you guys saw uh, Ben Frabel who had one of uh, just, just a great uh, COVID during COVID story. If you guys didn't see his talk earlier in this three hour session where he was talking about, they got to explore the coral reef from his couch, <laughs> just going uh, on uh, the, uh, the Sebastian and Falcor uh, remotely, which I think that that was amazing. And uh, they, they wouldn't have been able to do that with the uh, geologists, uh, the fishes to do that. So that was incredible. Nicholas, what was your rainbow? Um, I guess I'll do, do a two part, a science and a non-science. I guess the science is this, this guy's actually working and we, we did manage to pull a lot of that together in this last year, even though we had pretty limited access and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I spent years designing it and it was, I kind of hoped it would work, but you never really know. Uh, so that's been a huge relief just like last month when we finally got the final bits and pieces. And then on a personal note, just during, during COVID era, um, got, got to spend a lot of time with my significant other, my other SO, uh, and, uh, and we ended up getting married. Uh, we did a little courthouse marriage, uh, back in December. So, uh, I, oh, man, congratulations. <laughs> thanks. Ooh. Uh, Take that off on our uh, COVID to-do list with a Zoom wedding, so that was fun. <laughs> that is, oh man, congratulations. That is that is super, super awesome. Um, Andy, <laughs> you have a, your rainbow? Well, I, I would just, uh, you know, I'm like like Sonny, I, you know, I, we, we love science, right? I mean, I think everybody that, that does this feels privileged, right? Almost like you've been you know, given the, you know, just this rare opportunity to ask fundamental questions about how, how nature is, 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 uh, is operating and, and, you know, to, um, get a deeper insight into natural processes. It's such a, such a, such a privilege and, and, and gift, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of lonely, hard, hard work involved and in, in to extract nature for information from the universe, extract information from, from nature. Right. And, you, 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 you do, um, there's a lot of solitude involved in, in, in that. And um, so, you know, the opportunity to just like hear laughter, hear the laughter of, of my kids all the time and, um, and, and spend, spend time, you know, that I wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, with, with our family, you know, you really, you know, just through, through, through this process of, uh, you know, what, what the world has been through in, in, in the past year, you know, you just, um, you know, figure you get to a spot mentally where you um, really figure out what's important to 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 you and 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 what you know really mo motivates you and 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 makes you happy. And I I think that a lot of it has to do with your your connections, right, with the people you, you love. And so having the opportunity to think of, think about that and and embrace it and just have extended time has. Um, you know, I think moving forward, that's that's going to help uh, every area of of of, uh, of 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 our life, right? Because just you kind of have your priorities and 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 together in a way that you, you might not otherwise. You know, we're just running around like chickens with our heads cut off sometimes before the before the pandemic, and that's nobody's fault. It's just the you know kind of the the way the way the the way that uh, the way we conduct ourselves is right. I mean, you go on this trip and that trip, and you're doing this and doing that, and you know for what, right? It's um, it's uh, it's really it's really been a blessing, right? To um, to to connect with uh, with everybody. That's right. Yeah. Um. So I I I am privileged to work with all of you guys. This has been a really good, great, uh, uh mind blowing uh three hours. Uh, it's all. I want to give a shout out to you. She's been with me the whole time. Thank you so much. Uh, from, from beginning to end, asking questions, uh, that's beautiful. I've had many, many, many rainbows uh, during this time. Um, again, uh, along with you guys, uh, the time with my family, the connections that I've made, um, uh, and um, 
learning so many different things. I've found that um, having this time is also having brain time to let your brain absorb different things that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, so uh, my older my older human has learned how to play the piano and drums just because they have more brain capacity right now, right? Um, and uh, beautiful things like that. So I wanna thank all of you guys for being here. We're going to post this soon. I really wanna give a shout out to all of the people at lovestemsd.org, uh, Kim Richards, Sarah, um, all, 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 there, there's just a huge team of people that make all of this happen. Um, throughout this entire festival week, um, they could have easily taken a pass and uh, during this COVID time, and they, like me, like all of you scientists, uh, the biggest thing that we wanna do right now is engage curiosity um, and, and, and get kids where they're at. And so we, we make it happen. So we do it, so we do it and we reach them. And I wanna give a huge shout out. You guys, please go to steamfestival2021.com. Um, that's posted, it's open, it's equitable. It has access for everyone. It's gonna be there all year that you guys can find this stuff. Um, look for the League of Extraordinary Scientists and Engineers. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, Save with Love STEM SD. Um, we want to give a big thanks. And um, any of you guys can unmute and help me do the end the way we end this whole thing. And we're going to end it with stay curious yes. and keep, keep, on, keep on sciencing. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.